Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, please, if you could take to your seats, we will shortly be getting today underway. Thank you so much. If you could please take your seats, we will be getting underway in one minute. Thank you so much. Good morning and welcome to the Saudi Special Economic Zones Investment Forum in partnership with the Saudi Regional Headquarters Program. My name is Jane Witherspoon. I'm the Bureau Chief for Euronews Middle East and it's my absolute pleasure to be with you here today as your MC for this exciting event. Before we begin, please will you join me as we stand for the National Anthem. Thank you, be seated. Great to be here with you all today. Now, our forum is going to introduce Saudi Arabia's Special Economic Zones Program and the four new zones recently launched by His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Over the course of the next few hours, we'll explore the new zones in the context of the broader investment landscape in Saudi Arabia and the many opportunities here for international investors. We're delighted to host three panel discussions today featuring esteemed guests who will take us through the SEZ ecosystem and regulatory framework, the kingdom's evolving role as a global hub for logistics and industry, and the future of fast-growing technologies. 
In addition, we'll hear the latest updates on the regional headquarters program with a sponsored RHQ hosted lunch a little bit later. With that, it's my honor to welcome to the stage His Excellency Khaled Al Fala, the Minister of Investment and Chairman of the Economic Cities and Special Zones Authority, to deliver the opening remarks of the forum. Please put your hands together. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu wassalam ala Rasulullah. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah jami'an wa asadullah sabahakum. Your Excellencies, uh, esteemed guests from uh, partner countries, uh, and especially from the private sectors, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very good morning to each. Uh, and every one of you, and thank you very much for joining us today as we gather to discuss special economic zones. A cornerstone of Saudi Arabia's national investment strategy and our national industrial development and logistic program led by His Excellency Minister Bender al Khrayev, who is here with his team as key partners and leading and benefiting from these special uh, economic zones. The first wave specialists of special economic zones, which were launched on April 13 by His uh, Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman, are pivotal to the kingdom's present and future as an investment destination and reflect our sustained commitment to creating opportunities for global business. That commitment has helped make Saudi Arabia's economic and investment climate among the world's healthiest and most dynamic. We are now halfway between the 2016 launch of Saudi Vision 2030 and the date for its completion. One of our goals, of course, is to be among the top 15 nations globally in terms of economic size, and we're well on our way, having leapfrogged from 20th before the launch to 17th by end of last year. Our GDP is 70% higher, and our non-oil revenues more than double what they were when we started. Last year, our economy grew at an impressive 8.7% leading the G20. And just as significantly, as we steadily diversify our economy away from oil dependence, non-oil growth registered 5.5% in 2022, and I'm happy to say that early indicators so far this year indicate that that non-oil uh, GDP is continuing to grow at more or less the same pace as it did in 22. And our unemployment rate, which stood at 13% seven years ago, is already down to eight, just one percentage point shy of our vision 2030 target. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia's credit rating has been strong and in fact was recently upgraded to A1 and A plus by Moody's and Fitch respectively. And on the fiscal side, Saudi Arabia has the second lowest debt to GDP ra ratio in the G20 with a budget surplus amounting to $27 billion thanks to the sound and disciplined fiscal policy that the kingdom is uh, administering under the leadership of His Excellency Minister al Jadan, who is with us and who is a member of the board of uh, the Special Economic Zone Authority. But perhaps allow me to say, being the Minister of Investment, that the most 
dramatic shift has been Saudi Arabia's emergence as an investment destination, with FDI quadrupling since 2016 and the kingdom experiencing the second fastest post-COVID investment rebound in the world. Last year, Saudi Arabia's capital formation, which is the total investment from all sources, grew by an amazing 31% and exceeding 1 trillion Saudi rials for the first time and exhibiting a ratio of total capital formation to GDP of 25%. This is already well above the OECD average of 22% and positions us well to achieve our bold uh, target of 30% of GDP by 2030. Furthermore, capital formation is, be, is being driven by the private sector, not by government uh, project as in the past. And it's across enterprises of all sizes and within all of the key targeted sectors. Three developments in the Kingdom's investment landscape are specifically worth highlighting. First, related to our large-scale investment projects by the private sector, we have closed 285 billion Saudi rials worth of deals in the last year across various sectors ranging from auto to ICT, from agriculture to aerospace and from petrochemicals to mining and renewable energy. Second, VC investments for the innovative sectors hit a new high in 2022. At a time when the global VC sector was shrinking, VC funding in Saudi Arabia rose more than 70% last year to nearly 1 billion US dollars the highest growth rate in the region with the number of VC investments doubling year on year. And third, we see increasing interest in ESG investments here in the kingdom where the kingdom has already demonstrated its leadership through multiple projects such as the Neom Green Hydrogen Project which at 35 billion Saudi rials is the largest of its kind in the world. Then the Kingdom's EV manufacturing uh, cluster being developed in the King Abdullah Economic City, one of the zones that will be discussed today, where we're not only attracting the OEMs and building 500,000 cars by the time the project's underway uh, mature, but also building a supply chain and creating uh, a platform for uh, major exports of EVs from the Kingdom. Then there is the Saudi Green Project, with, which aims to increase renewables contribution to our electric generation to 50%. And then we have the enclaves, where renewables will be the sole source of electricity without connection to the grid, like the Red Sea Project, NEOM, and others. None of this, ladies and gentlemen, happened by chance. It is the culmination of our vision, of business reforms, unique opportunities, healthy incentives, and transformative initiatives, of which I am confident that the special economic zones will be a key, miles, uh, a key cornerstone going forward. And most fundamentally, the kingdom inspires confidence across multiple social, economic, and business indicators, both broader ones, such as investor sentiment, and you see one of the recent surveys by SMP, others like trusting government and ease of doing business, and specific indicators, such as digital competitiveness, road connectivity, cyber security, and quality of port operations where the kingdom is already leading the world. These de developments clearly have not been happening in a global vacuum. 
but are taking place against the backdrop of a fast-changing global economy and geopolitical environment. That includes a qualitative shift in foreign direct investments. While lower in volume over the last few years, FDI is becoming more selective as well as knowledge and technology intensive. Then there is the trend towards shorter supply chains and the, uh, the redirection of these chains to trusted partners, French shoring as referred to. Last year, more than half of companies that were surveyed reported that they near or reshored their value and supply chains over the previous 24 months, mainly to enhance national security and resilience of these companies. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, there is the impact of the energy transition, largely driven by the race to net zero and the need to lock in green industrial bases of which I am confident the kingdom will be a premier one. Globally, investments in green supply chains, such as electric vehicles, batteries, and hydrogen, represented an impressive 35% of global greenfield projects in 2022, with the scarcity of critical materials driving much of that investment. Given these dynamic developments, though, let me ask a rhetorical question that I know is on the minds of some of you. Are special economic zones still relevant for high growth economies like Saudi Arabia? The answer, in my mind, is a resounding yes, and that's why we're here today. Globally, we're seeing SEZs, SEZs gain renewed relevance as part of a broader industrial policy comeback trend, where large incentive packages and a new generation of SEZs are used to attract FDI selectively and targeted supply chains. G20 nations like Korea, Mexico, and China have long used them for inward investment and export-focused industrialization. But we're seeing recently that even G7 countries, uh, the UK, for example, in 2021, launching eight new free ports, which are essentially special economic zones, demonstrating how also world-leading economies are seeing SEZs as a target, targeted policy mechanism. SEZs, of course, are not enough alone. They're an integral part of this broader trend of government support and incentives. Last summer, the U.S. included more than 600 billion U.S. dollars in incentive programs like the IRA and the CHIPS Act, while the EU, Canada, and other G20 econo economies have pursued similar policies and incentives totaling an staggering $1.5 trillion uh, for, um, you know, for global uh, economy. And this does not include the COVID uh, response schemes. But I have to emphasize, ladies and gentlemen, that today's special economic zones must go beyond the financial and the hard offer of incentives and infrastructure and deliver, deliver on the soft offer of overcoming bottlenecks for strategic industries and activities, mostly, mostly through regulatory frameworks that are enabling. So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Saudi Arabia's next generation zones will enable the kingdom to play and win in this redefined global context. Forward-looking, innovative, and focused on attracting FDI, our SEZs are purpose-built to maximize opportunities and minimize friction across key industries. The Kingdom laid the groundwork for these future-focused SEZs by establishing 
our national industrial development and logistic program, which I referred to earlier, and our national investment strategy, which included amongst its tools, the SEZs, but also the Global Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, GISRI, which was launched in October last year by His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince. This is Saudi Arabia's integrated plan to use its competitive advantages, such as resource endowment and prime geographic location to develop our most promising sectors while enhancing the sustainability, not only of the kingdom, but the global and regional supply chains. Each of our SEZs will facilitate competitive cluster development in future-looking future and export-oriented sectors such as advanced manufacturing, manufacturing powered by renewable energies, cloud computing, biotech, maritime industries, and the automotive sector, amongst many. The SEZs will be complemented by a very important component for international investors and for exports, which is the special integrated logistics zones as part of the logistic and transport strategies. These zones will be located near ports and near major airports. The first of these is the Riyadh integrated uh, zone, the kingdom's fully integrated logistic bonded zone launched last October also next to the King Khalid airport here in Riyadh which, by the way, was built from the ground up around the requirements of global anchor investors. Amongst them is Apple, which is already starting its operations within that zone. And our SEZs, ladies and gentlemen, not only provide a global best-in-class regulatory and tax environment, which I refer to as the soft offer, but also offer investors the potential to partner with us on value chain development, diversification, and resilience. They will also serve for us and the investors as a regulatory sandbox, allowing the government and investors to experiment, innovate, and generate positive spillovers. Indeed, these zones are part of a comprehensive effort to strengthen Saudi Arabia's standing as a premier global investment hub while providing global businesses across multiple sectors with a launch pad for growth to new targeted markets. Another key element of the Kingdom's integrated strategy, which was referred to by the opening remarks of our MC, is the Regional Headquarters Program, or RHQ, which offers unique benefits to international companies to establish their regional hubs for the Middle East and North Africa here in the Kingdom and specifically uh, here in Riyadh. So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me summarize by emphasizing that Saudi Arabia is already meeting its economic and investment goals well ahead of schedule and beyond expectations. Our special economic zones will further contribute to our transformation journey by driving innovation, enhancing our ability to attract world-class companies and talent to the kingdom, strengthening national capabilities of vital non-oil sectors, and creating immense value for both our investors and our people. This is only one of what will be many exciting sets of announcements this year related to our investment landscape, which I look forward to sharing with you the next time we gather, which will be, by the way, uh, in 12 days when we host the Chinese uh, Arab uh, Business Leaders Forum uh, here in the King Abdulaziz Conference Center. In closing, I once again wish to thank all of you for being with us today. I want to thank the many partners who have made the launch six weeks ago by His Royal Highness of uh, these zones, what it is, uh, a globally leading model 
of investment enablement through special economic zone. I want to thank the business leaders who are with us today and who are watching us as we stream uh, this, uh, this event for the accomplishments we've already achieved. And as I mentioned, we are doing a lot before the launch of these zones, but also for turbocharging our uh, investment uh, journey going forward using these zones as a new tool and the toolbox not only for us, but for the investors as well. And I thank each and every one of you for your attentive li uh, listening, and I wish everybody a very uh, successful and informative forum. Thank you very much. Saudi Arabia lies at the crossroads of East and West, connecting three continents. The country is rapidly transforming, buoyed by a surging economy. On its doorstep is a superhighway of trade, creating a key international hub for logistics, manufacturing, and services. And now, with the launch of four new special economic zones, created with international investors in mind, it's easier than ever before to take advantage of all the kingdom has to offer. King Abdullah Economic City Special Economic Zone is the premier destination for advanced manufacturing and logistics. Set in a prime location on the Red Sea, it offers unrivaled access to global trade routes through Saudi Arabia's newest full-service commercial port. Ras Al Khair Special Economic Zone as a hub for the maritime industry offering opportunities across shipbuilding and repair, offshore drilling, and the entirety of the maritime sector value chains. This is a fully integrated maritime ecosystem with a strong base of existing investors. Chazan Special Economic Zone on the Red Sea connects investors to a new platform for trade with the fast-growing markets in Africa. Located adjacent to one of the Middle East's largest ports for export of goods and import of manufacturing materials, Jazan also has easy access to the kingdom's natural and industrial resources. Embrace our digital future through the new cloud computing special economic zone located at King Abdelaziz City for Science and Technology, a platform for emerging and disruptive technologies to flourish and for investors to capitalize on. Together, these strategically located SEZs present an unparalleled opportunity for foreign investors looking to grow stronger and more resilient supply chains, backed by world-class hard infrastructure and a young and skilled workforce, business-friendly regulations, streamlined investment procedures, and attractive economic incentives. There has never been a better time to be part of the Kingdom's economic success story. Four new zones, four new global hubs, four game-changing opportunities. Welcome to Saudi Arabia's Special Economic Zones, unique gateways to growth. Thank you again, Your Excellency, for that welcome address. Next up, I'm pleased to welcome to the stage Mr. Nabil Koja, Secretary General of the Economic Cities and Special Zones Authority, also known as EXA, to give his introductory speech. Please put your hands together. Assalamu alaikum. Sabahkum Allah al Khair. Bismillah wa salat wa salam ala Rasulillah. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, these are indeed exhilarating times for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And today we are creating history once again with a new milestone that represents a journey of alignment teamwork, drive, and ambition. Moreover, it is the commitment 
of more than 43 government organizations and stakeholders that allows us to make history here today. These efforts have culminated in the launch of four new special economic zones that will drive immense growth in the kingdom and contribute to the Vision 2030 goals. Throughout this ambitious journey, we have been clear about our objectives from the very beginning. Our process has been designed with the investor in mind, and this has been our focus from day one. The planning and development of these new SEZs were strategically carried out in a trifold approach, combining three crucial elements to form a cohesive and calculated outcome. The first element in our formula for success is personalization. We put the investor We put the investor at the forefront of our efforts by ensuring our SEZs are designed to cater to their specific needs and requirements, thus ensuring a personalized experience that fosters growth and success. Specialization is the next key factor that we considered along this journey. As a result, we are launching four unique SEZs, each with its own unique value proposition and offerings. These SEZs complement each other, creating a diverse and interconnected ecosystem that will attract a wide range of industries and businesses. Finally, integration. Integration lies at the heart of our philosophy. When we designed the ecosystem, we made conscious efforts to ensure that these zones would successfully integrate with base economy and the kingdom's logistics infrastructure. We also designed these zones to work with one another and act as one integrated investor platform. Yes one integrated investor platform. These four SEZs represent our unwavering commitment to economic progress, innovation, and creating a thriving business environment in Saudi Arabia. And we invite the world to be part of this magnificent, transformative journey. And now, it is our honor to present the official licenses to each of the new special economic zones, marking a significant milestone in Saudi Arabia's economic development. Once again, thank you all for joining us on this momentous occasion, and congratulations to the new SEZs for their official licenses. on stage with us. So, as we mentioned just there, X will now issue the licenses to each of the new special economic zones in the presence of the X board. Please welcome to the stage His Excellency Khaled al Afala, Minister of Investment and Chairman of EXA. His Excellency Banda al Koroyev, Minister of Industry and Mineral Resources. His Excellency Mohammed al Jadan, Minister of Finance. His Excellency Ahmed al Raji, Minister of Human Resources and Social Development. His Excellency Faisal al Ibrahim, Minister of Economic and Planning. And finally, last but not least, please welcome Mr. Essam al Mohadib.
So let's get things straight underway. For King Abdullah Economic City Special Economic Zone, I'd like to call to the stage Mr. Fahad Al Saif, Chairman of Imar Economic City, Mr. Cyril Piaia, CEO of Imar the Economic City and the master developer of King Abdullah Economic City. Welcome, gentlemen. Just present them with the license. Here we go. As they pose for a quick photograph at the front of the stage. Congratulations. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, to receive the license for Ras Al Khair Special, Special Economic Zone, I'd like to invite to the stage His Excellency Khaled Al Salam, President of the Royal Commission for Jubail and Yanbu, and Mr. Ahmed Hassan, CEO of the Royal Commission for Ras Al Khair Industrial City. Congratulations once again, gentlemen, just receiving their license there and their photograph. And I would like to request His Excellency Khalid Al Salam to stay on stage with us. Now, to receive the license for Jazan Special Economic Zone, I'd like to call to the stage Mr. Hussein Al Fadli. Acting CEO for Jazan Special Economic Zone to join His Excellency Khalid Al Salam, President of the Royal Commission for Jabail and Yabu. Welcome. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, once again. license for the cloud computing special economic zone I'd like to invite to the stage His Excellency Mohammed Saud Al Tamimi Governor of the Communications Space and Technology Commission CST and Vice Chairman of his board as well as Mr. Aid Ibrahim Al Fayez CST's Deputy Governor for IT and Emerging Technologies to invite all of their excellencies and SC representatives to come up onto the stage for a group photograph. If we can get everyone back up on. Let's please congratulate them all once more on these fabulous license awards. Gentlemen, thank you so much.
Now, as you all may know, an enormous amount of thought and effort goes into establishing the right business environment for investment to thrive. Given the importance of this work, it's no surprise that our first panel of the day is focused on the ecosystem and the regulatory framework for the new special economic zones and the role the SEZs have in creating new avenues for FDI, trade and economic prosperity. What takes an investment opportunity from a great idea to a tangible reality? Attractive incentives and world-class infrastructure are only part of the story. For investors, a streamlined regulatory environment is essential. That's why Saudi Arabia's new special economic zones have designed a bespoke regulatory framework, benchmarked against international best practices, giving investors confidence with labor regulations and conditions which facilitate business expansion, import and export requirements, that ensure a seamless flow of goods and flexible, secure real estate and property rules to support long-term planning. Our simplified one-stop shop licensing process enables companies to set up smoothly and without hassle. Together, we are helping international investors and global companies establish and scale a foothold in one of the world's fastest growing economies, accelerating their regional and international growth through a globally connected market. Be part of an economic success story. Saudi Arabia's special economic zones. Unique gateways to growth. This panel will be moderated by none other than Becky Anderson, one of CNN's top anchors. Becky will host the conversation with His Excellency Mohammed Al Jadan, Minister of Finance. His Excellency Ahmed Al Raji, Minister of Human Resources and Social Development. His Excellency Khalid bin Mohammed Al Salem, President of the Royal Commission for Jubail and Yanbu. Mr. Nabil Koja, Secretary General of EXA, and Mr. Chris Walters, partner at leading law firm Herbert Smith Freehills. Over to you, Becky. Very good morning. Mr. Finance. Mr. Follow the uh, Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, and a very good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be back here at the Ritz Carlton in uh, Riyadh for what is a very, very exciting <coughs> moment in time. Uh, for the kingdom. Um, I'm Becky Anderson, CNN's managing editor and host of Connect the World with Becky Anderson, broadcast nightly, of course, from uh, our programming hub in Abu Dhabi. SEZs play, can play, a significant and strategic role in the economic development of a country and are proven drivers of growth when implemented effectively and efficiency, uh, efficiently. And the kingdom, and certainly we heard from the Minister of Investment, believes in the relevancy of these SEZs with the aim of raising global competitiveness for the kingdom in what is an extremely high growth and fast paced economy at this point. With these possibilities invariably come challenges. We will discuss, I hope, in the next 40 minutes or so, those possibilities, those benefits, and those challenges. So without further ado, let's, let's kick this off. Minister of Finance, Your Excellency, we did hear uh, from Khalid al Fay about the relevancy of special economic zones um, in the kingdom in 2023. And I'd like to just drill down briefly, if we can, uh, with your opening thoughts and perspective on why these are relevant in 2023 and the impact that you believe these can have on the kingdom and how that impact fits the vision of 2030. Thank you very much, uh, Vicky. It's good. Um 
to be here and thank you, Your Excellency Khaled Al Faleh, um, for hosting us today. This is a very important day, um, not only because we are actually celebrating a very important milestone, but it is actually halfway through Vision 2030, and we are celebrating, as His uh, Excellency showed earlier, the success that. Uh, have taken place through the journey, and the journey is continuing. And just to go back to your specific question, uh, special economic zones have a very specific purpose, which is basically largely supporting growth and complementing whatever initiatives that you are doing within the economy, uh, harvesting the benefits of where you are located or the competitive advantage that you have, uh, in the country. In Saudi Arabia, we are the only country worldwide, I can say this with confidence, in 23, the only country that have received three positive actions from the three rating agencies, um, which basically just confirms that the journey that we started six, seven years ago is going on the right track. We are seeing the growth, we are seeing the momentum, we are seeing the private sector confidence. Mm. And special economic zones comes to complement that. We wanted really to accelerate the success that we have achieved, um, ensure that we continue the growth, harvesting some of the opportunities that we saw building up through the last seven years, and ensuring that we are also um, taking advantage of the global value chain uh, movement at the moment of mm. ensuring that there are multiple uh, hubs around the world that provide uh, supply chain. Um, Saudi has a very competitive advantage connecting three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Um, we have fruits that are very important for the, the, the global trade that we can actually capitalize on and w which we are doing. And we are actually looking at what industries and services that does not exist in Saudi Arabia or exist in a very small scale that we can actually utilize special economic zones hmm. to uh, build on and, and attract investments and growth. That's really basically what we are doing with special zones. At this point, thank you. Let me br just bring in uh, Nabil Koja here before I come to the ministers, because I do just want to get a sense from you then. If the key goal in launching these zones is to raise the kingdom's global competitiveness, can you just be a little bit more specific about the economic cities and the SEZ's ecosystem, which you've provided to enable that competitiveness. Can we just be a little bit more specific? Okay, uh, but before that, if I can just explain the journey that we actually took when we were establishing the ecosystem, uh, Becky. Our journey included doing a lot of analysis, benchmarking, and studying to really understand what the global landscape looked like in terms of global regulatory frameworks. That then followed by a gap analysis, and then as a result of that, we've identified specific components that the investors were looking for. As a result of that, we've established a regulatory framework that comprises a set of overarching regulations that work and connect all of the special economic zones that we have. In addition to that, we also have specific or sector-specific regulations. These regulations are not necessarily for all zones, but for specific sectors and clusters that are being targeted within these zones. In addition to that, we ensured that we had regulatory tools that looked at how these zones would integrate with one another. So interoperability from an SEZ to SEZ point of view. Mm -hmm. We've also looked at 
regulatory tools in terms of ensuring how these SCZs would play from an interoperability perspective with the base economy, both from a services point of view or also from mm. uh, a trading point of view. All of this together has come and culminated and has been established as our regulatory framework. Now, we also believe, uh, Becky, that this is always a continuous improvement project. We don't want to set regulations now and forget them forever. No, we believe that we have to be agile in our approach. And this agility requires us to continuously monitor the impact of these regulations, as well as suggest and add new regulations and stay in tune and in touch with the investor. So when a particular investment or sector is being brought in, we actually tune in and really try to understand that sector requirement and ensure that they actually have what they're looking for. Thank you. Minister of Human Resources and Social Development, let's just concentrate for a moment on talent. That's your file and that's important and that is going to be hugely important if these uh, zones are to be successful. Talent is increasingly critical for investors. How will these zones enable businesses to leverage Saudi Arabia's growing workforce? And then I'd like to talk about the um, opportunity <clears throat> for the international workforce. Let's, let's kick off with the local workforce. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate our uh, colleagues in EXA and the chairman of the board, His Excellency Khaled Al Falih, for the remarkable launch of the four special economic zones, which has been announced by His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman last mm -hmm. April. Uh, uh, no doubt, global experience has shown the benefit of creating SSEs and attracting FDI. At the same time, the technology spill over it creates. Now, we think, and I'm sure the aim of these SSEs is to attract global firms, and they will tap into the local talent that we have in the base economy, as well as the global talent. Um, for your information, uh, we have uh, one of the most diverse labor force in the world. We have 180 nationalities in the base economy today. We have, uh, uh, the, the Saudis are constituting 25% of the total. So today we have 10 million labor force. 25% of, of that 10 million are Saudis and 75% are experts. We as a ministry have done our analysis and we have seen that there is good percentage of that talent pool. They are very good in skills as well as qualification. Mm -hmm. And this is in our opinion, this is a very important uh, tool for the SSEs that this is a, a talent pool that they can tap into. At strategic level, we as a ministry, the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Development in 2020, we have uh, embarked a labor market strategy. Uh, this strategy focuses on improving the work environment, increasing the labor participation, and as well as increasing the labor productivity. Of course, with the economic growth expected, aiming to achieve the target unemployment rate. That strategy has 28 initiatives. I would even call them reforms. Most of these initiatives, either they have been implemented or in the way to be completed. Mm. Uh, and we started to see the result of these initiatives. For example, to, to list some, today we have full labor mobility for expats. Today we have uh, a wage protection program where we as a ministry make sure that every employee they receive their salaries on time. We have today as well 3.8 million electronic contract has been authenticated. 74% uh, of the labor disputes are settled outside the courts. And more importantly, in three years time, the private sector have hired 
more than 500,000 Saudis. Mm. And most of the 500,000 Saudis, they are new and fresh graduates. Now, the, the, the government has done its role by creating a fund called Human Resources Development Fund, HRDF. This fund has different programs where it helps the employers to uh, hire Saudis. One of the programs called Income Support Program, where there is a wage sharing between the employer and the fund for 24 months to bridge the gap between the education system and, and the labor market. We have also other programs, which is reskilling, upskilling, and different type of training. All these incentives given by HRDF, which is now given in the base economy, today we can announce that it will be expanded to the special economic zones. So the special mm. economic zones, if they decide, if they choose to hire Saudis, they will enjoy the incentives given by HRDF. That's good stuff. And I, I'm going to come back to you and talk about the flexibility uh, that you are providing for the uh, global work workforce on an incoming basis, because I think that's going to be really important. And I want to understand what's meant by flexibility. Before I do that, Your Excellency Khaled Al Salem, um, you are not new to this world. The Royal Commission for Jebel and Jambu has been overseeing industrial cities in the kingdom since 1975. I wonder, as you consider the ecosystem that has been, um, that has been established for these SEZs, how you see them coming to life, and what lessons you have learned from existing projects that you think will be important as these SECs um, get going? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Becky. I, I, I am not new to SECs. I started this work when I was under study uh, in Saudi Arabia. At that time, we were thinking about uh, what to focus on for our SECs. If uh, His Excellency Khaled Al Falih talking today in his presentation about exceptional investment and foreign uh, uh, investments, then what we want here in Saudi Arabia. I think uh, we are targeting certain uh, uh, industries that is illustrated in uh, national industrial strategy, national mining strategy, even in the logistics strategy. Uh, we are uh, filling the gap to achieve the targets of those strategies. Now, uh, with uh, Royal Commission for Jubail and Yambu today, uh, thankfully to uh, Special Economic Zone Authority and uh, esteemed board for granting us uh, two licenses today. And uh, we have also thanking our tenants. Uh, again, in the presentation, we have seen how trust the business mm -hmm. Uh, 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 leaders on, on, on the country itself and its laws. For we can see, uh, we will see today even agreements. For they are with us already since the uh, promising them that this will come forward and we have it today. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with the ecosystem, I think uh, uh, first of all, we need to respect the uh, 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 developed criteria, the uh, 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 governance, because it is uh, done and reviewed with uh, many st stakeholders uh, in government and private. For, uh, for as uh, a manager for, for these two SEZs, uh, I think this is very important. Otherwise, we will uh, create an issue with the base economy. Mm -hmm. The uh, second, I think we need to uh, create a partnership between the government and the private institutions uh, within uh, SEC to uh, uh, really uh, uh, solve any uh, issues that arise uh, during the implementation. Mm. Uh, Royal Commission for Jubail and Yambu is very successful when it comes to respecting its uh, 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 governing laws. Uh, and it is uh, uh, a leader in, in this area. But we think it will be even easy to adopt. Now, the agility, 
to solve the issues is very important. Feedback system uh, need to be uh, developed. Uh, it should be a robust feedback system with our private investors in the SEZ. And uh, we need also to uh, have, we are working on it actually with our uh, friends and the authority to have one-stop shop. And one-stop shop, it can be done even mm. virtually because uh, we are already in Saudi Arabia advanced when it comes to uh, digital solutions. And uh, last but not least is to cover this with uh, digitalization in order to uh, achieve uh, and uh, bringing this ecosystem uh, alive very quick. Yeah, you can understand the complexities of the implementation of stuff like this, but this is very intentional. Chris, let me bring you in at this point. From your experience, how important is it to investors that there is a clear regulatory framework for SEZs? And what, what are some of the key legal benefits that you see offered by these new SEZs. I do want to talk to you about challenges, but let's start on the upside here and the key benefits that you see as you read the ecosystem and the structure as it stands today. Uh, I mean, ultimately, a, a clear regulatory framework is essential for the longevity of these economic zones, and particularly with a focus on international investors, you're wanting to create a, a system and set of processes and procedures that allow them to invest what might be significant amounts of capital into these economic zones and then to employ people, whether it's foreign nationals, it's domestic employees, and ultimately they need stability in order to achieve their long-term goals. And those long-term goals will ultimately support the long-term goals of the Economic Zones Authority. So unless you have that robust set of rules and regulations in place that, you know, great to hear that there's the effectively the one-stop shop, so mm. there's going to be commonality between all four zones, then the international investors are going to have a number of questions that relate to the protection of their investment. One area that we would typically see as a point of scrutiny would be how do the economic zone rules interact with the wider national laws because ultimately these economic zones provide a smaller ecosystem to deregulate to facilitate trade and investment mm. but also to introduce new rules that help modernize the national laws so ultimately what you need to look at from the point of view of an international investor is are they going to be surprised in five or 10 years by a significant change of law that might undermine their investment. I think what is also important is that with the economic incentives that are on offer, that the host nation is actually in tune with the economic zone authority to ensure that there's ultimately no real difficulty when it comes to the existing network of international investment treaties or even World Trade Organization rules that relate to subsidies, for example. So there's quite a lot to unpack and think about mm. and, you know, at least for the first period, there will be an evolution of some of the founding laws. There might be new areas that need to be regulated, but there should be a clear process that all of the stakeholders in the economic zone are invited to participate to in order to effectively ensure that the rules are suitable for all mm. parties that are participating. There's some very good points being made here uh, by all of our um, uh, guests, including Chris, and I perhaps you'd like to just you know, um, uh, speak to some of what's just been discussed. And how, I wonder, does the kingdom ensure that the base economy isn't negatively affected by these uh, new economic zones, isn't cannibalized by the effort that goes into raising the global competitiveness through the establishment of these zones? Minister. Thank you. Um, I think these are very, very important actually topics, very relevant to what we are discussing. And I'll try to cover some of the points uh, very quickly. Just to recap some of the, mm. what I've heard earlier, and um, I think what is really important is to just highlight that the way the philosophy behind the um, you know, the special economic zones 
policy design, okay, is few things. One is they need to actually achieve a very clear purpose. Uh, it's not really just creating a, a special zone for creating a special zone. Mm -hmm. They need really to fill a gap uh, in, in the economy. Second is they really need to be um, designed as a policy to give as much freedom to the investors mm -hmm. as possible, uh, simply because largely they are actually um, export-oriented. Um, we wanted to make sure that investors feel the freedom to select the talents, as His Excellency mentioned, mm -hmm. that he needs, uh, and not constrained by the base economy um, regulations. Three, they need to complement and not compete against or cannibalize against mm. the base economy. So guardrails have been put in place to make sure that this does not happen. Um, another guardrail is we need to make sure that they do not cannibalize each other. So each, each zone has a very specific purpose, very specific industry or subsector industries or services that will be licensed and will not be competing with another, uh, another uh, special economic zone. Otherwise, they really be, they will be a race to the bottom. Mm. Um, few things also that we looked at um, in terms of how we are going to approach this. Uh, one is what kind of um, incentives that investors would be looking at. Um, and I totally agree, being an ex-lawyer, that predictability is key. So even if we wanted to give certain incentives, you need to make sure that these incentives are very clear and very predictable, so that, because people are investing for 10, 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. and they cannot afford to take the risk of actually the government changing the rules in the middle of the game. So we, we wanted, and we have now made it very clear that the incentives, the regime, will be fixed for a certain period of time. Things that are risky are now fixed in terms of time, and we could talk about some of them through the course. I'm, I'm sure Nabil and uh, others will be, will be covering them, and I'm more than happy to go through them. Mm. Let's just bring you back in, um, because I suggested that I wanted to talk about what is one of the key benefits offered by the SEZs, which is flexibility and supportive regulations around foreign talent. So let's just pause there for a moment and have you just drill down a little bit more. Can you elaborate further? What does that flexibility mean? How will SEZs support businesses to attract that global talent? Let's focus there for just a moment. Thank you. Uh, I, this is a very important question. Uh, uh, first of all, we, we, the nature of the SEZs that has been announced today, they are sector specific. And the aim is to attract global firms in certain industries. That either they are in an infant stage, that they want to move to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, the incentives has been designed was tailored incentive packages after a very careful study of the global and regional benchmarks to make sure that these incentives are competitive and flexible in the eyes of the global investors. Mm. And today I would announce that one of these incentives, which is very important probably to the investors, is exemption from Saudization requirement. So the SSEs will be exempted from Saudization requirements vis-a-vis -vis the base economy, yet they will receive the incentives from Human Resources Development Fund if they choose to hire Saudis. Mm -hmm. And they will be given the chance to tap into the base economy if they decide to. Uh, and this is for us is very important as a ministry because one of our labor market strategy goals is attracting global talent. So we wanted to attract global talent. And the SEZs is one of the tools where it will help us not only hire Saudis, but also attract global talent 
with the challenge that you mentioned about the global talent and the challenges with the skills. So this is basically a, 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 a major tool for us to achieve one of our targets. And we, as a, as a ministry, we are committed to work with our partners, um, government agencies, to fulfill the kingdom aspirations in terms of uh, FDI attraction, in terms of GBD, GDP growth, and eventually labor market prosperity. Fascinating. Secretary General, let me bring you back in. The kingdom has had somewhat varied success, and I was going to use the term limited, let's call it varied success in the past with economic cities. And let's be quite frank here, the uh, KAEC originally intended as a hub for logistics and manufacturing has had limited success in attracting investment and residents in the sort of numbers that were originally planned with a vision for 2035. So given that we're in a new era, way after those original cities were launched. Just explain what has been learned from those initial projects, which makes these SEZs more likely to succeed. And any plans that you might have to expand these zones going forward? Clearly, we've had the launch today and the license is given on the first four, and there is the logistics hub, of course, by Riyadh Airport as well. So if you're going to just address those two, uh, if you will, you know, lessons learned from the um, experience to date and potential for expansion of these zones, if indeed they do what you hope <laughs> they will achieve. Well, thank you for that question. First of all, I'd like to just highlight that we're talking about two very different eras. Okay? The era that we are in today is the era of Vision 2030, mm -hmm. which comes with a, a different set of strategies, as well as different set of incentives, and an entire different framework. And we firmly believe that that will make a significant change. Mm -hmm. And we see evidence all around us uh, to suggest that. But I'd also like to just take a moment and reflect on what His Excellency uh, Al Jadan mentioned in terms of protecting base economy. Mm -hmm. And we believe that this is a very important component. At the heart of our design, we created specific tools to ensure that base economy is minimally impacted. One of those tools is the eligibility criteria for anyone to be able to come into these zones because we wanted to avoid migration from base economy into these mm -hmm. zones. So we were very clear that we're looking at purely new investments. If you are in base economy, you can invest in a totally new investment, but not close and relocate. So this is one of specific regulatory items that we've actually added. Another one is, as was mentioned by His Excellency, each and every one of these zones is created around a specific cluster mm. objective. Okay? And the aim of those clusters is to build not only tier one, but tier two, tier three, an entire environment around specific clusters. Those clusters have been strategically targeted and linked as part of mm. our 2030 vision. And mostly, those clusters currently either do not exist in base economy or are not strong enough in base economy. Thus, there's enormous opportunity to come. Mm. So within the overall design, we took care of a lot of those items. And Chris, let me bring you in here because this is a completely different era. We've listened to um, the Minister of uh, Investment today just explaining where Saudi Arabia is at um, as we are halfway through um, the uh, Vision 2030 timeframe. I remember being here in 2016 at the launch of uh, the Vision 2030. I'm actually can't believe we're we're halfway through. I mean, I'm sure that uh, you know you guys are, are are kept awake at night and ensuring that you are all on track. As you 
consider the market here? And as you speak to potential investors, what are you being asked about most regularly? And as these special eco economic zones get launched, what do you expect to be the sort of laundry list? So ultimately, we're still in a relatively emerging market in the global sense. And what's been very apparent over the last two to three years is the interest that is generated globally in investing in Saudi in particular. And what clients that we advise typically look at is ultimately the legal system. So with these new economic zones, it will be better understanding the interplay between the economic zone authority and the traditional national authorities, and then how the new rules and regulations are actually brought into effect, because that is a process that will ultimately have a day-to-day -day impact on the businesses that operate in these zones. I think Saudization policies has obviously been something that has been around for a long time, and you, know, you mentioned challenges earlier. One of the challenges will be balancing the desire for attracting foreign skilled workforce and then continuing to promote the employment of Saudi nationals. And in addition to that, international investors and Saudi companies as a whole, they're looking more at ESG. And rather than seeing the economic zones as a way to effectively deregulate markets because Saudi has got a lot of rules and regulations, it's a sophisticated legal system, it's how can we effectively modernize the rules and regulations so that you've got better functionality at board level, for example, between international investors, Saudi partners in the context of Saudi companies. And also, you know, some of these economic zones are focusing on heavy industry, for example. And a question there is, you know, how does your environmental permit sit? And then what is the auditing process? to ensure that you've got this robust international best practice in terms of compliance. So I think they are the areas that will, you know, they have been focused on. I think they'll continue to be of importance to international investors to ensure that if the international investor is a, a global player, they're obviously investing in a country that supports their overall international network. That's fascinating to look at this through the perspective of ESG. Uh, and, and sir, going back to your experience of industrial cities and the, uh, and the growth of those since, uh, since 1975, um, you know, incoming investors didn't have an ESG sort of strategy back in 1975. How do you see the impact of what, what Chris has just explained? And where do you see the opportunities afforded for Saudi, and I think this is a good question to everybody as we close this out, the impact is not just on the growth for competitiveness going forward, but the very nature of the regulatory framework, good governance in this country, how much of an impact have these uh, economic zones had, even in their sort of drive for implementation, and where do you see the future? Sir. Uh, when, uh we look at it, I think we were looking of um, completing, as we said, the gaps in our uh, strategies and um, not only to attract uh, only the investment. I think what type of investments and what criteria is uh, implemented around those investments and not only the license that we are giving for the investor today but we, as a manager, we will continue to oversee and make sure everything is promised by the investor is implemented within the city. And, uh, uh, you know, we have the local content authority here in Saudi Arabia, and this initiative is uh, very strong. And uh, this is one of the drive to really uh, localize the whole value chain uh, for example, when we talk about uh, uh, in Ras al Khair, the maritime and uh, shipbuilding, for example. Now it is uh, clear for us as a manager that we will target investors that 
they produce uh, uh, parts, products that will go for shipbuilding, nothing else. But it's, uh, I think uh, this is the uh, uh, beauty of, uh, of the design here. Uh, uh, the impact, we worked with our uh, colleagues to uh, illustrate even in numbers what we are targeting out of each city. But we we uh, put the numbers, it took a lot of discussion, details, what type of uh, projects we are bringing within, within these cities. And uh, uh, for example, within Royal Commission for Jubail and Dimbo, the two cities we are targeting, for example, when it comes to employment, over uh, 110,000 uh, employees. Uh, when it comes to uh, 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 our uh, contribution to uh, GDP uh, over uh, 50 billion uh, rials. Uh, and that shows how the detail of really what impact we are looking for. Uh, I hope this answer uh, the question. We've got a couple of minutes and so Minister, I think I'm gonna leave you to provide some concluding remarks um, for this panel. Let me just sort of urge you to address um, why it is that this vision remind us why it is that these zones fit the vision in 2023 with seven years to go. What the long-term commitment to these zones is and how you believe these zones are not just helping um, impact the drive for global competitiveness through the very nature of these zones, but to Chris's point, what's been learned in the development of the regulatory framework, which will help the kingdom as a whole going forward? Thank you. A um, few things, I think very quickly, I would say, Special economic zones are actually a very important project when you look at Vision 2030. Um, so they will br bring more FDI. Vision 2030 calls for more FDI with specific targets. Um, private sector participation, because they, all investors will be private sector. Vision 2030 has very specific targets on increasing private sector participation in the economy. Exports, a lot of these industries, a lot of these zones are actually designed and focused on exports. And export is a very important target under Vision 2030, increasing exports and nano oil GDP uh, with very specific targets. Uh, local content, Increasing local content, particularly in the oil industry, to 75. Some of these zones will actually help achieve that, that target. And the, the list goes on. The second part, I think, which is important, we did not talk about specifically, is what are the commitments we are giving to these zones? And these commitments are possibly, I would categorize them in, in three categories. One is a government clear interaction. So we wanted to make sure that there is a very clear streamline and governance around the interaction between the investors, the zones, and the regulator. And the regulator has a very clear mandate to ensure that we all, as gov government agencies, comply with all the announcements that we have made. His Excellency, announced some, I will mention some. The second part, but let me just, before I go to the incentives or the commitments, the second part is making sure that whatever commitments we are giving is a future looking. And so there is an outlook of what are the developments that are happening in the world. A lot of investors no longer actually care much about tax um, incentives simply because there is a huge shift in the international tax regime. Um, and they, under the OECD, now Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 are almost agreed and, and will be implemented. So we wanted to make sure that we provide this option. So we are going to provide a tax reduction. 
um, for 20 years so that the, the investors have that predictability. We are providing perpetual withholding tax exemptions. We are providing perpetual VAT exemption on transactions between um, uh, entities within the special zones or entities within different special zones. We are providing incentives in um, you know, talent attraction um, and all fees that are related to talent at attraction. We are providing incentives in terms of fees. And let me just cover one area where we haven't really touched on, which I'm sure a lot of the audience and possibly people outside will be asking for. Why are you doing this? When I am investing in your base economy, you are not giving me the same incentive. I think the message is, is very basic. The way we look at this is just imagine that this industry is in a different country. Just imagine that it is in Qatar. We have the minister from Qatar or Bahrain or Dubai or Oman or Egypt or Iraq. We are not going to tax them. We have no Saudization on them. We cannot regulate them in any way. They are outside. The only thing is when they send products to us, we impose custom. And the benefit for us, for them being there near our base economy, is all the private sector and the base economy will benefit from these ecosystems being available. They will hire, even though they are not compelled to hire, they will hire actually talents from the local economy. They will hire and rent and go to school in the base economy. They will use private hospitals in the base economy. They will buy from the grocery shop in the base economy. So this is how we are looking at it, so that we are not you know, living in a, in a dream where we have you know, seen others doing it and we are doing it. Now actually we analyze the benefit and we understand the challenges and we needed to address them and we put the guardrails around them. We understand the worries of the investors and we needed to make sure that we give them a very clear commitment and we understand the benefit and we will harvest that benefit. With that, we've gone over our time. Thank you very much indeed. You made that very, very clear. Thank you for your closing remarks and thank you all uh, for what is an extremely enlightening panel uh, on what is a very exciting day uh, for Saudi with the launch of these zones. Thank you very much indeed to my esteemed panelists and to you in the audience. And for those of you who are watching internationally, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Becky, and to our panelists for that fascinating discussion and insight. I hope you're all enjoying your morning so far. We've got lots more to come for you. Now, as you all just heard over the course of our first panel, the new SEZs are an important part of Saudi Arabia's economic story. While SEZs have their own regulatory and physical infrastructure, they don't exist in isolation. Investors depend on a wide set of factors at both local and national levels to support their growth ambitions. To facilitate and shape the SEZ environment into one that is supportive and enabling for investors, EXA have worked closely with partners across government. Today, EXA is entering into agreements with several government entities who've all made valuable contributions to the streamlined investor experience of these SEZs. To exchange these agreements, I'll now invite Mr. Ali al Madawi, Vice Secretary General for Special Economic Zone Affairs at EXA, and Mr. Sultan al Mashhur, Director General, Strategic Partnerships to the stage. Welcome, gentlemen. Please put your hands together.
and the first agreement is with the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Development. For this, I'd like to invite Mr. Hani Almogil, Deputy Minister for Labour Policies, to the stage. And this agreement will establish exemptions related to human resources in the zones, simplify the visa and immigration process for foreign talent, and provide flexibility for businesses within our zones regarding how they manage their labour affairs. Please put your hands together once again, ladies and gentlemen. Next, an agreement with Ministry of Transport and Logistics Services. For this, I would like to invite Mr. Khaled Aboubayan, Assistant Deputy for Logistics Operations at the Ministry, to the stage. This agreement will extend the Kingdom's world-class logistics capabilities into the zones, giving investors access to efficient and multimodal connections to support their business activities locally and connect them to international markets. Round of applause again. The next agreement is with the Ministry of Justice. I'd like to invite the Assistant Deputy Minister of Justice, Mr. Suleiman Alolayan, to the stage. This agreement will provide clear mechanisms for dispute resolution, activating an efficient reconciliation process within the SEZs through the Reconciliation Centre. And we now have an agreement with Zaka Tax and Customs Authority. For this exchange, please welcome Mr. Anas Al Ogla, Deputy Governor for Legal Affairs and Compliance at the Authority, to the stage. This agreement aims to activate incentives related to tax and customs duties and provide transparency to investors in the zones about how to manage their tax affairs. The agreement will facilitate a streamlined customs process empowering investors to efficiently import and export goods from the zones, ultimately creating a seamless experience. Next is an agreement with the Saudi Standards Metrology and Quality Organization. To exchange, I invite Mr. Fahad al Quaik, Vice Governor, Business Support at the organization, to the stage. Please put your hands together for Mr. Fahad. This agreement will provide investors with a comprehensive understanding of the standards and quality requirements applicable to products manufactured within the zones. In line with global best practice, of course, and additionally, the integration of service provision will streamline procedures for businesses, simplifying processes and enhancing operational efficiency. Now, an agreement with the Saudi Food and Drug Authority. Please welcome Saad Al Ghamdi, Assistant VP for Branches and Inspection at Saudi Food and Drug Authority. This agreement will extend Saudi Arabia's world-class standards regime for food and drugs to the zones, while also simplifying how investors in the space leverage services from the authority. Please put your hands together. A few more still to come, bear with us. Next, we have an agreement with the Saudi Export Development Authority. I'll now invite Mr. Abdulrahman al Thuka, CEO of the Authority, to come up. The agreement is set to unlock mechanisms and incentives crucial for facilitating the export aspirations of investors within the zones. Through this agreement, we aim to establish a strong commitment to ongoing enhancement of regulations, protocols, procedures, all geared towards fostering a business-centric export environment. And to conclude, 
we have an agreement with the Saudi Center for Commercial Arbitration. Please welcome Dr. Hamad Mira, the Center's CEO, up to the stage. This agreement will provide alternative dispute resolution and commercial arbitration services in the zones. By leveraging global best practices, this framework will ensure a transparent mechanism for resolving disputes. Investors operating within the zones can have confidence in a fair and efficient resolution process, promoting a business-friendly environment. Thank you once again to all the partners who've contributed to the establishment of this ecosystem. Thank you all. Now that brings us to our second panel of the day, focused on industry logistics and supply chains, a hot topic here in the kingdom and also worldwide. Successive cataclysmic events have exposed the frailties in global supply chains. Backed by the Global Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, Saudi Arabia's SEZs will create new industrial hubs, underpinned by the kingdom's world-class infrastructure. Connecting our world, forging, strengthening, and expanding global supply chains. Logistics is far more than point A to point B. It's the lifeblood of every business model, enabling growth and driving competitive advantages. From electric vehicles to fast-moving consumer goods, medtech to construction, maritime to mining. Together, we are creating a global investment powerhouse in one of the world's fastest growing economies. Saudi Arabia's new special economic zones are strategically positioned, located at the crossroads of East and West and connecting three continents. They sit at the very heart of major trade routes. King Abdullah Economic City SEZ, Jazan SEZ, and Ras Al Khair SEZ. All of our logistical special economic zones offer state-of-the-art port facilities with efficient connections to air, rail, and wider Saudi industry, providing stability and reliability in a time of global uncertainty, offering a new pathway for international investors and ambitious global companies to accelerate their regional and international growth through a globally connected market. In a changing world, focus on the fundamentals. Saudi Arabia's special economic zones, unique gateways to growth. Now, this panel will be moderated by TV anchor and live news correspondent, Rebecca McLaughlin Eastham. Rebecca will discuss the future of global supply chains and the role Saudi Arabia has to play in them. Alongside His Excellency Khaled Al Falle, the Minister of Investment and Chairman of the Economic Cities and Special Zones Authority. His Excellency Banda Al Khurayef, Minister of Industry and Mineral Resources. His Excellency Abdulaziz Al Dualit, President of the General Authority of Civil Aviation. Mr. Fahad Al Saif, Chairman of Imar Economic City. And Mr. Andy Tsoi, Managing Director of Hutchinson Ports. Please put your hands together and over to you, Rebecca. Good morning, nice to see you again. Assalamu alaikum. Please, sorry my hands are so cold. Please take a seat, Minister. Hello. Welcome, Her Excellency. Nice to see you. How are you? Nice to see you again. Good morning again to you, Andrew. Please take a seat. Thank you so much to Jane Witherspoon, my esteemed colleague from Euronews. Assalamu alaikum. And it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me today. It's my Great pleasure to have such an incredible lineup of panelists on such a historic day. What a morning it's been so far, wouldn't you agree? Let's get things started, let's get down to business because we have plenty to discuss. Um, 
Your Excellency, we're well aware of how the Global Supply Chain Resilience Initiative was put together last year and why, the founding pillars of it, the, the overarching aims and intentions. The question I have is why now? Well, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, and once again, uh, uh, thanks to uh, everyone for being here. Uh, I think why now, first of all, is we have to put this in the context uh, of what is happening globally. Uh, global value chains, uh, just from an uh, engineering, design, um, and, and uh, sourcing, is changing uh, because of multiple multiple things. There are uh, industrial revolutions going on, there are uh, uh, shifts uh, because of energy sustainability, and this is of course the topic du jour. Everybody is saying uh, where, where do we produce at the lowest carbon, deliver with the lowest carbon uh, footprint in terms of delivery, and meet the ESG targets, the net zero targets. So that's, that's a big uh, topic, but it's also coming at a time when, uh, as I mentioned, the technology, the next industrial slash uh, technology revolution is taking place. Everybody's talking, of course, about AI today, but this is a trend of automation. Uh, shifts in demographics uh, is, is, is a very important thing globally. Uh, China, which has been growing, and, and of course a big pool of uh, uh, labor has, has peaked in terms of, uh, or will be peaking and declining, and new uh, areas of labor and talent and markets are emerging as these shifts uh, in demographics. We've seen the impact of COVID, and we hope COVID uh, is not repeated, but uh, I think most people are planning what is the next crisis that is going to cause some ports to be closed, long supply chains to be, to, you know, to, to, to present vulnerabilities to companies and countries. Uh, and that has led to what I referred to in my remark, this massive shift in global uh, supply chains where people want to make sure they have quality, reliability, reasonable cost. It doesn't have to be the lowest cost. Uh, and of course, uh, sustainability. Uh, and it's no longer just about access to labor and economies of scale. I think there is the adage, it's not just economies of scales, but economies of skills are becoming uh, very important. Uh, so this is uh, a challenge and an opportunity. We in Saudi Arabia see it as an opportunity. We think we sit in a very beautiful place where we can tick all of the boxes with our global supply chain resilience initiatives, which actually, uh, although uh, I have been given the, the honor by His Royal Highness the Crown Prince to coordinate it, it's really being led by His Excellency Minister uh, Bandar al khrayef and his team because uh, and our, uh, our ministry and ecosystem of logistics because uh, as well, of course, as, as His Royal Highness, the Minister of Energy, because it's underpinned by reliable uh, energy uh, that, that, is, that is clean and, and sustainable and, and meets, it's, it's, it's by an informed, progressive and manufacturing, what I call it as advanced manufacturing strategy, we call it the national uh, industrial strategy, and then the logistics and transport uh, strategy. They all come together under the NIDLIP program. We are, of course, powering it with international investors, and we think the time is now, and I think it's the, 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 it, it will benefit greatly from the special economic zones and both international and Saudi investors will use the zones that have been discussed today to power this JISRI program and, and to create powerful solutions to the global uh, challenges and opportunities I mentioned earlier. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Minister, let me come to Your Excellency. Um, in terms of the national industry strategy, another strategy laid out last year, big overarching ambitions, not least to increase industrial activity. 
In nuts and bolts at grassroots, this means around 35, 36,000 factories by 2035. Who's going to be running them? What industries are you seeking to attract? And what has investor and overseas appetite been like so far? Thank you. And I probably I would just uh, talk about the ambition of the industrial strategy from two angles. One is definitely the numbers. We are aiming for great targets when it comes to GDP contribution, industrial output, export, job creation, and so on. But I think what is most fundamental in our strategy is really the diversity that we are trying to achieve in the economy, in the sector, trying also to add value within the country in all elements of the industrial sector. So from natural resources, uh, things like advanced chemicals that is coming from our petrochemical industry, advanced also manufacturing that is coming from, or added value coming from our mining sector where we see ourselves not only a mining country, but also as an industrial. So the targets of the, of the, of the strategy is really to uh, leverage on the strong industrial base that we have had for almost 50 years now and see how we can take it to the future. Definitely, as His uh, Excellency uh, Khad al-Falah mentioned, advanced manufacturing, <coughs> AI, 3D printing, additive manufacturing, and so on, are key to our industrial growth because they allow us to grow much faster than um, uh, traditional way, but also they are an excellent tool to create the right jobs for, for the future and contribute truly to the global uh, supply chain. Uh, when we look at the SEZs and how they come in the picture, is really um, uh, we have to be also mindful of the fact that SEZs is not just a one-size-fits-all. Uh, it has to be designed in a fashion that allows for each region to, to benefit. I had the privilege, probably, of looking at SEZs from different angles, so from the Ministry of Industry and Mining and seeing how it will contribute. And definitely, it could also create a disruption for us within the main economy. <coughs> and also, from NITLIB, as heading NITLIB and trying to see how uh, the economic zones can help all of the sectors of NITLIB be enabled in one way or another. And finally, as uh, part of also my responsibilities was heading the XCOM at uh, EXA and looking at the specific applications from the different, uh, uh, the, the different zones that we were looking at. So, and I think it's, uh, we came to to uh, a decision where we are actually ena enabling each different zone to, uh, to focus, to create its ability to attract different investors in a line of business that can co collaborate with each other, get benefit from the main economy, but most importantly, allow us to be uh, accessing different markets. And finally, I think what what is very important to us, especially in the industrial sector, and especially that we are aiming for growth in, in export, is allowing our uh, uh, trade abilities to be much stronger. We need, we need the connectivity to be uh, better. We need uh, more lines. We need more access to different shipping lines. This will definitely reduce the cost on, uh, on uh, the trade, but most importantly, for exporters. So, uh, and that is also uh, um, helping us in our targets with re-export. Saudi Arabia is aiming for growing re-export uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the next uh, 10 years. And uh, special economic zones are key component of re-export activities, uh, but they also bring value when it comes to the connectivity and getting the best out of our location. Thank you. If I can just pick up on one point, a quick question on how do you ensure that these SEZs do complement and support and not disrupt the main economy? I think that's, uh, that's uh, a very uh, important part of the equation. Um, but if you look at our, our economy, it's really an open economy. Saudi Arabia is one of the 
very few countries that we almost have uh, limited, if no, if none, barriers. So our average custom duty is almost four and a half percent. That's a very low. So we have an economy that is open. Uh, the only, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, probably upside that could come from SEZs is bringing more business to the economy rather than taking out any business from the economy. We are blessed with different resources that the uh, SEZs can also, or players, investors in the SEZs will be able to benefit from, uh, mainly our, our uh, natural resources in oil, gas, and minerals, our energy, also competitiveness, our human capital also, which is developing in the right way, and also meeting the uh, future, I would say, job market rather than, than the legacy job market. Uh, but most importantly, it is actually creating a foundation of different uh, services uh, that will help both. Uh, if we look at uh, Ras al-Khair as, as, as an example, and as his Excellently mentioned, His Excellency mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, it is going to be a full-fledged maritime complex that will allow Saudi Arabia to position itself as a main player in the sector. Uh, it's a sector where no country uh, will have enough demand for. It's a it's a global demand sector. So, uh, but also on the other hand, we have the um, mining where we uh, today, as we speak, actually. Uh, Ras al Khair is the main port for our mining activities. We see it contributing uh, more and more to the mining activities, allowing mining uh, services, um, allowing mining uh, 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 companies to be present also to uh, complement what we are doing in mining today. So I think it's so far uh, we, we did what needs to be done to ensure that there is a balance. But I think it's, it's always going to be uh, uh, monitoring how these activities do actually uh, be enhanced and uh, being agile as we go. Thank you so much. May, yes, please. May I just uh, uh, follow to what His Excellency uh, just said? I think in terms of uh, competing with rather than complementing or disrupting uh, rather than helping the main economy, Globally, and certainly in Saudi Arabia, all value chains source a lot of their components and inputs from outside the economy where they operate. And that's no different in Saudi Arabia. In fact, in Saudi Arabia, we may be above average in terms of insourcing from the outside uh, some, some of the inputs into our industrialization. We still have a very high local content within our industry, but certainly nobody is 100% self-sufficient. And our industrial enterprises today are sourcing from the outside. In the future, they will be able to source a lot of their inputs from special economic zones that are very close. So although they're sort of, you know, pseudo offshore in, in, their, in their regulatory framework, they're onshore in terms of their location. So Saudi manufacturers who are integrating inputs from these special economic zones are getting just in time, lower costs, yeah. lower financing and working capital, and integrate in terms of technology, standards, and specifications with these industries that are going to be located in a special economic zone. So I see it as a huge boost to our main economy industries that are serving the kingdom and the region. Thank you so much. Your Excellency, let me come to you, picking off on what His Excellency and the Minister had to say. Um, Saudi is extraordinarily well connected, but how do the SEZs plan to really leverage that uh, across the three continents, by land, by sea, and by air? And how can investors benefit? Well, before I you know, answer the question, I would like just to you know, mention one uh, important point about the aviation strategy and uh, uh, I think it's a philosophical question that was raised by His Excellency Mr. Al Jadan about why we have what is the objective and why we have you know these uh, special economic zones in the aviation sector and strategy which was approved two years back uh, we had three main objectives one is 
around passengers to triple the number of passengers from 100 million to about 330 million by 2030 and connectivity to increase connectivity from about 100 uh, destinations to more than 250 and last but not least is to quadruple the number of uh, the air freight cargo from about 800,000 uh, tons to about 4.5 million tons of which about 2 million in transit. Uh, we all know that about 1 million ton of, of air cargo is leaked to the neighboring country and it comes by air and then it comes by car to Saudi Arabia. So we have a long way to uh, do economic reform, regulatory reforms, and also develop the infrastructure uh, to ensure that we can attract uh, that traffic. Uh, the uh, Riyadh integrated or uh, the special logistic integrated zone uh, I can proudly say that it is the first uh, special logistic zone uh, consisting uh, or compromising of all the benefits and incentives that were mentioned by uh, the distinguished ministers in the previous uh, session. The uh, special uh, logistic integrated zone, uh, ILBZ in Riyadh, or now it's called Riyadh integrated, with about three uh, million square uh, meters. Uh, offers uh, unprecedented incentives uh, and unparalleled uh, incentives to the uh, investors compared to what has been offered in the region, uh, starting from uh, the uh, relief on uh, tax for 50 years, uh, no uh, corporate income tax or zero, uh, also uh, capital repatriation, exemption on VAT, exemption on customs and duties, 100% ownership, uh, foreign ownership. Uh, as mentioned earlier, very flexible labor requirements or, and, and, uh, and structures. Uh, and we, uh, ta we are targeting also uh, value added and unique industries from consumer uh, electronics to computers uh, to pharm pharmaceuticals nutrition and medical supplies and also in the aviation the airspace and spare parts of course we have also the, um, the one of the categories is the uh, luxury uh, fashion and uh, luxury goods and, and precious materials uh, so all of these uh, incentives uh, are put in place with the cooperation and support of all various government entities uh, to provide a conducive uh, environment, an attractive environment for investors uh, to join. And as mentioned earlier, also we have Apple as the anchor investor started their operation earlier this year. And uh, we have announced three more uh, investors, iHerb, CJ Logistics, uh, Shell Hoop Fashion. And uh, we also are going to announce two more, uh, you know, signing ceremonies today. I'd I would don't want to, you know, to burn the, uh, the uh, event for the team, but it's, it's ongoing, continuing. And I think also we are in the final stages of uh, completing the technical and financial and feasibility studies for replicating the same model in Jeddah and the MAM uh, over the next few years. Over the, over the next 12 months, did you say? Over the next few years, so now we are in the... Yes, okay, I think we have some major breaking news there, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. But we, uh, we will have some more announcements, uh, it sounds uh, like it, Your Excellency. Thank you so much. Um, Fahad, let me come to you. Paint the big picture, because of course, um, EEC and MR with the master developers of uh, Cake, King Abdullah Economic City, what a location, how strategically is it positioned, not least for extra pathways domestically to different provinces? Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our leadership in selecting uh, King Abdullah Economical City to be among the first batch of the Special Economical Zone. I would like also to thank the government, spearheaded by His Excellency Al Falih, being the chairman of IGSA, and also all of the ministers who have supported this important historic milestone uh, to, be, uh, to enable Saudi to unleash the potential, yeah. and I think it's for us to lose it. And also I would like to thank uh, IGZA for being patient, but assertive, 
for us to achieve the uh, the timeline. It was marathonic, but also at the at also it was a sprint at the end. Um, special economical zone is a geographical area that is wrapped by policies and regulations that could give the investor the conveniency and the opportunity and the advantage of to use that geographical place to have a cost efficient uh, and the convenience, conveniency of technology and attracting talents to uh, be able to extract, to uh, put on the services and to be delivered in timely manner uh, within regulations and taxes and, and more, most of the incentives that are to be awarded. Now adding on top of all of that is the geographical location of CAKE uh, being at the center of 13 to 15 percent of the global trade, a complementary port that we have in, co in comparison to Jeddah Islamic port. Uh, very well done infrastructure in CAKE, uh, which is an extreme important enabler. Very much focusing on certain industrial and logistical sector, which is automotive, food, logistics, and pharmaceutical. At the moment within CAKE, we have 100 investors. 40 of, of them have already uh, operative facilities. Uh, we are very much keen and focused within uh, King Abdullah Economical City, and more specifically EEC, is to offer conveniency. How are we able to interact all of the partners and the stakeholders to ensure that we are able to get the finance, the right master plan, the infrastructure, to be very much re uh, reciprocating the feedback of our investors with the regulator to ensure that the regulations that we have are seamless in a sense of making the, uh, the decisions to be made uh, imminently. Um, we are very keen uh, on being able to play a leadership role on, on this important historic event. And therefore, we have refreshed our strategy to ensure that we are able to put in and to take in the international and the local investors' requirements to be able to offer them a ready, vision-ready platform. Thank you so much. Well, speaking of the private sector, of course, we're delighted uh, that Andy has flown in from Hong Kong, ladies and gentlemen, to be with us from Hutton Supports, um, an iconic company when it comes to uh, the development and managing of all aspects of uh, uh, port relations. You've been in Saudi operating since around uh, 2000, is that right, for the last 23 years or so. But looking at your global portfolio, your bigger network, you've got more than 50 ports in more than 26 countries. So my question is a simple but a huge one. Why Jazan and why now? Um, Rebecca, before I answer your questions, um, just want to clarify, make a small clarification. I'm not the managing director of Hutchison Port. I'm only managing director of Hutchison Port for Middle East, Africa, and uh, South Asia region. Um, my boss, Mr. Eric Gibb, he sent his apology. He realized his passport, his uh, Saudi visa expired. Um, he came, in fact, uh, two months ago to, to, with a Hong Kong delegation. He met, he met His Excellency Engineer Khalid uh, before. Uh, he sent his apologies, um, so I'm a last-minute substitute, but I'm more than glad to be here, and thank you for uh, the, your excellencies uh, for the invitation. Um, Rebecca, to tell you the truth, I can talk all day on this topic, uh, because there's just so many reasons why Hutchison Ports should be investing, and is investing in the kingdom. Um, just to give you an example, in Jasan, Hutchison Ports has a landlord, in fact, we look at it more like a strategic business partner uh, because this is one of the friendliest uh, government entity that I've experienced around the world. You know, we're in 54 ports actually, uh, 25 countries. So this is quite a remarkable comment. Um, Royal Commission will build a very impressive industrial, um, industrial zone at the southern uh, Red Sea coast, a strategic location with excellent economic and industrial potentials under very favorable business environment. You can see I'm looking at my notes all the time because this is sent <laughs> from my Mr. Eric Gibb overnight uh, before I flew in from Hong Kong. Um, we share the same vision with Royal Commission and under Royal Commission's leadership, Hutchison Port can leverage its global network, its expertise, and contribute to the development of Jisan as a key hub for port operations and trade-related logistics in the region 
and connection to the world. We have been, as you mentioned, we have been in the kingdom for 23 years, and this is, has been a very wonderful journey. We're very excited about all the opportunity ahead of us. As His Excellency Engineer Khalid mentioned earlier today, we're in the second half of the kingdom's vision 2030. And Hutchison Port believes all the major participants in the Vision 2030 will be a win winner in their own ball game. The kingdom's unique geography with two beautiful coastlines, right in the mix of two very important trade lanes of the world, far east to the Gulf, which is the upper region, and transatlantic trade connecting to both the Gulf and far east under a very efficient connection to the world. Together with the opportunities in the to invest in the Eastern Province, which we kind of already do with Spark Logistics. But of course, we will try to develop a seaport opportunity as well. And cope with the land bridge concept, we have an excellent opportunity to experience the kingdom's true potential in the global logistic and supply chain management. Saudi Arabia's east-west industrial cities, special economic zones, mega projects, oil-related industry, economic diversifications will serve as a platform to springboard this already very powerful economy to become an important and integral part of the global logistic and supply chain network. Thank you so much. Um, Andy, let me uh, give you a quick follow-up question in light of our, our topic today. Um, being positioned at Jazan, being in Saudi Arabia, uh, what level of security do you feel when it comes to the resilience of the supply chain uh, in uncertain times, if we can call that now? Um, I think Hutchison brings to the table a state-of-the-art infrastructure, most advanced technology that will overcome any obstacles ahead of us. We're the first container terminal operator to apply remote control technology in the Middle East. Which, will en which enable young generation to join the industry. It's like playing a video game. And we also enable female crane operator, which is the first in the, main, in the region, in particular in the Mam port. We will bring an upgraded remote control um, equipment to Jisan and plan to bring in electrical autonomous truck as well. Our network in the Middle East, Southeast Asia and China and Europe is one of a kind, which will complement the already strong Saudi Arabia international trade. I may also add that our focus will be on job creation, technological innovation, knowledge transfer, strong commitment to sustainability. Hutchison Port will be very focused on all aspects of security arrangement within Jisan region to make sure the port is safe and cater for the economic growth in the region. Thank you so much. Your Excellency Afala, let me come to you. Um, how would you sum up Saudi's role with the SEZs when it comes to being a significant global link in the supply chain in uncertain times, the resilience to future shocks? Where do we stand? Uh, well, related to th this question is, is, uh, is uh, somewhat related to the last question because uh, there is no country I think in the world and I have been around for four plus decades so I have seen and I have negotiated and I have managed operations all the way from uh, East China to, uh, uh, to Western uh, Americas and, and I can tell you there is no country out of experience and necessity that has the combination of policies, practices, and capabilities to manage risks the way we do in Saudi Arabia. Whether it's industrial safety, uh, whether it's uh, security, given, given the region we live in and, and, and uh, what, uh, what we have experienced. And I think most proudly for us, our environmental sustainability. Uh, if you look not only at the standards of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but the practices of Saudi Arabia in terms of managing emissions, spills, uh, climate and, and uh, the ecosystem, if you fly over our coastlines, 
and see how we are protecting those coastlines, the mangroves, their virgin after 100 years of development and industrialization. Uh, I think, uh, and if you look at the statistics of companies like Sabic and Aramco and MAD, and their injury records, their carbon emissions and intensities, and, and their, uh, how they manage also other aspects of the environment. I think you will know, you will know that in, in Saudi Arabia, if you're a global player, you're going to access uh, this, uh, this ecosystem. And it's very enabling. Our, our regulatory organizations do work with industrial players, with logistics players, as, as uh, Hutchinson Port leader just, uh, just mentioned, to make sure uh, they benefit. So our coastlines are, are, of course, protected, and our ports operate without a hiccup. Unfortunately, uh, you, when you compare that to statistically and objectively speaking, to other countries, you will find out that Saudi Arabia is indeed a place that can manage the local, environmental, and global shocks uh, better than others. So this just creates part of that value proposition that I discussed earlier, where in the kingdom, you have low risk, uh, and, 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 and risk, of course, comes in from different sources, different kinds, and different colors. But all of them, I think we, we're one of the lowest risk uh, location. We're low cost, especially in these special economic zones, because as mentioned in the previous panel, we're removing uh, all of the regulatory uh, you know, cost barriers, whether it's custom duties, uh, uh, corporate uh, income taxes. We've always had no personal income tax uh, on, uh, on individual. And we have low friction, uh, regulatory friction, and we've seen the licenses and the agreements just being, being, being exchanged with other government agencies. And you will see it in the stand of EXA and uh, in, in, in the exhibit outside where they demonstrate how EXA will, and, and, and the regulators of the zone, Jubail uh, and Yambor Commission, uh, CITC, and CAKE, each one of them will pro provide to the investor a low friction, one-stop shop uh, uh, regulatory uh, environment that is, that is fast, predictable, stable, as His Excellency Al Jadan assured us he will work with us from a zakat, uh, custom duty, and tax, uh, and tax uh, perspective. Uh, all of this is going to give us the resilience you ask about, and it's going to allow these uh, investors that come to the kingdom to, one thing we didn't talk about adequately, I think, today, is the importance of innovation and technology. Uh, and innovation and technology is going to come from two sources. Some of it will be homegrown by the kingdom uh, with, with our innovation RDI uh, ecosystem that is already strong and developing. Right next to CAKE is KAUST, one of the world's best research uh, and science and, and education uh, university. Uh, King Abdulaziz City of Science is being recharged uh, to do more uh, 20 plus universities with research uh, capabilities. But the companies we attract, we're going to incentivize them and, and, and help them to, bu to build also and integrate with, with our RDI. And that will give them, of course, fuel for future product development adaptation to global, uh, global trends. And of course, ultimately, it's about access to people, whether they're Saudi or international, and we're going to make sure that the best talent is available. And I think it, it's, it's a long answer, but it takes all of these put together in a very enabling environment to create the resilience you asked about. Thank you so much. I'm back in the room, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Your Excellencies, thank you so much for that answer, uh, Your Excellency. Minister, let me come to you, because um, to pull out some of the strands from um, 
what we've just heard. On the sustainability side and the environmental impact side, how is it uh, for that to coexist when creating an industrial economy? And when it comes to incentives, we've heard of the financial ones, but what of the softer ones? What of the sustainable and econ um, environmental ones for companies and investors looking to set up in these SEZs? Well, probably if I talk about the two uh, locations uh, that are related to the, my sector, which is uh, Ras al-Khair uh, and uh, Jizan, uh, this you know, Royal Commission of Jibali uh, is, is a great entity that has been existing for almost 50 years now. So the discipline when it comes to different activities is already there. It is part of their DNA, it's part of their culture. So. Uh, and um, the second probably important thing to say is that the, as Nabil was mentioning when he talked about how we chose or we decided to go about these economic zones with personalization and being mindful of how they can complement each other and how they can ensure not to cannibalize the, 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 the main economy. That includes all kinds of regulations to ensure that there is no there is no, uh, uh, they are not going to be uh, export strategy, logistics strategy, localization, and so on. They all have compliance, uh, being uh, 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 able to compete on the long run. So even incentives, I think it's very important to mention that incentives are, are calculated in a, in a way that allows investors to uh, initiate the project, but projects need to be uh, sustainable on the long run. This is, this is key. When we look at the mining, the way we built our mining strategy is all about ESG, transparency, uh, making sure that we learn from others in, in different parts of the world where uh, mining was, uh, in many cases, unfortunately, uh, a, a, a created the, the wrong impact, uh, I must say, uh, for environment, for social development, and so on. We are trying to change this. In fact, we are not only trying to change this in Saudi Arabia, we are trying to change this on a global scale through our, our uh, future mineral form, where we are bringing different stakeholders that are in, uh, uh, interested in the sector from government to mining companies to service providers to financing entities, academia, in one platform to ensure that uh, we are, uh, as we embark in our journey of sustainability of future uh, zero targets, we are doing it uh, in the right way. We are doing it in the most uh, efficient, uh, but also environmentally uh, right and socially right. Thank you so much, Minister. We are rapidly running out of time, <clears throat> but uh, Your Excellency, let me come to you. Um, what's next when we meet again? What will have happened? Where are we going? What's next for transport and logistics in the kingdom? Uh, too many. <laughs> I cannot summarize it in, in, <laughs> in, in a few minutes, but uh, I think we're going through uh, unprecedented transformation in our transportation and logistics uh, initiatives and programs in the kingdom. Uh, this specifically in the aviation, uh, you might have heard that we have you know, announced uh, the Riyadh Air and also the uh, transaction for uh, securing more than 121 wide body 787 Dreamliners for Riyadh Air in Saudi Arabia. We're expanding our airports, uh, the announcement of King Salman Airport, uh, catering to 120 million passengers by uh, 2030, the master plan has been com completed, including, of course, the logistic uh, uh, village and logistic hub uh, in the airport. The master plan in Jeddah also has been completed and approved uh, with an airport city catering to more than 120 million passenger by, passengers by 2030. Uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, the legislation, is we're doing a lot of work on uh, improving the uh, regulatory uh, economic uh, frameworks to uh, attract more investors uh, on the, the whole ecosystem, whether it's ground handling, MRO, cargo, catering. Uh, we are attracting investors. We are opening the market 
for new investors to uh, create competition and, uh, and uh, achieve the targets that we are striving to achieve. Much to look out for. Watch this space. Thank you so much. Um, Fahad, let me come to you. With uh, PIF being a major investor in Cake, what's in the pipeline? What's on the horizon? Thanks. Um, indeed, PIF is a major investor, 25% as a shareholder. Uh, but in addition to PIF, there are all of the vision realization program that PIF also plays a part into it. We're very much in harmony with the ministerial uh, strategies. Um, I would like to point, since we, you are wrapping up, um, the land bridge that is expected to be, which was announced by the Minister of Transport and Logistics, that connects the west side with the east side of the kingdom, that's a complete game changer in the history of trade, which I think it is for, uh, for the western side of Saudi and particularly King Abdullah Economical City, especially Economical Zone that will uh, generate a lot of opportunities, whether it's an investor or a financier. What we're trying to do as a PIF is to ensure that, or oh, the PIF is very much focused on incubating particular sector, which was already announced, the automotive, the food, the pharmaceutical, and the logistics, to be in uh, King Abdullah Economic Zone, more, more precisely, the special economical zone. But let me also point another potential. We have the best performance from an efficiency, efficiency point of view port, uh, according to the World Bank, that has been ranked the first twice in, in the last two years. Easily, the 7 million TUs of cargo and containers could be doubled. And therefore, we are very much willing to incubate and to sponge all of the capacity that is required. I think our challenge in King Abdullah Economical City, specifically EEC and the partners, is to make sure that we have that convenient package we are very much in sync with the National Development Fund, in addition to PIF. How are we able to put a convenient package where the IRRs will be easily equated into financial model and the investor only to focus on how to create an innovative logistical and supply chain and industrial uh, sectors that will be able for them to put the right markups. Thank you so much. Andy, last but by no means least, let me come to you. You sit here with a captive audience, not least on stage, speaking to the ministers. Um, what would you like to see change or more of? What further developments, be it reforms, incentives, or support of any kind, would make a difference to Hutchison Ports? Um, I think we have all the support we need, in fact. Um, you know, I've been recently, I've been on a business trip with uh, His Excellency Engineer and Khalid, the Royal, Chairman of Royal Commission, Yambu and Jisan. Um, all he talks about is progress of Jisan port. What are we doing next? It's more of, uh, you know, we, while we're, I'm trying to show him what we can do and deliver to Jisan from our overseas experience in Barcelona, in the, the United Kingdom. He's driving, he has leadership. We, that's all we need, I think. Um, for, for Hutchison port, you can see the government the difference between 20 years ago when I'm here and what I'm dealing with in the government entity, uh, my counterpart, um, they're driving me more than my boss is driving me. So the success is, uh, is all laid out. Uh, it's only for me to put in the right resources, the right people. Um, we've done it before, uh, Rebecca, as I told you backstage. Um, in, in Shenzhen in South China uh, in 1990s, we started from scratch. Uh, the, the Yantian port was a fishing, fishing village. The Yantian port and the economic zone now is so successful and it's one of the major hub, uh, logistic hub for the, for, the, for the whole wide world. And from zero uh, to where we are today, we're handling about 14 million TEU per year in one single container terminal. So the experience is there. The leadership from, South, from the kingdom is there. I think we have a successful model to go with already. Thank you so much. Your Excellency Alfala, let me come to you for closing remarks, the final word. Uh, we're halfway to Vision 2030, as we've been hearing this morning. An amazing milestone, so many milestones already achieved. 2030 and beyond for SEZs, what's your big hope? Well, first, first of all, let me just uh, remind everyone is uh, 2030 by itself is not the destination. It's actually an intermediate milestone 
And in the next few years, with the leadership of our visionary Crown Prince, uh, you know, we will be, we will be uh, extending the planning horizon even further. And the kingdom will continue to integrate globally, bring the best the world uh, has to give in terms of companies, innovations, talent, better future, in addition to all of the qualitative things, still has to have a competitive degree of profitability for our investors. So as a minister of investment, that's my number one KPI. Ensure that every investor, Saudi, international, regional, and many of them are with us today, are as profitable today, if not more, than they could be uh, anywhere else. And it takes, uh, it takes all of us working together. It takes His Excellency, it takes our logistics system represented here by, by His Excellency Abdelaziz Dailij. It takes uh, our regulators and, and uh, sector leaders. It takes our very strong private sector from, uh, from Saudi Arabia to benefit from and to feed into these uh, um, global investments. They don't have to be global investors, but they're powerful uh, global investments that are going to grow and evolve over time to create solutions to problems we haven't identified, to reap opportunities that I'm sure will be, will be discovered uh, together through the, the base economy, complemented and turbocharged. I call these these, uh, the, these special economic zones are boosters that are mounted on a spaceship. And they think of the kingdom as a spaceship. We're mounting boosters to go higher and to dream uh, further and, and to create uh, great things. One thing I can assure you is this is a journey and we're going to be uh, more committed to it in the future than the great commitment that has been illustrated by our uh, key stakeholders uh, to today but, uh, but the spaceship uh, that, that we're trying to boost is the private sector. And we're committed to them. And I want them to know that the kingdom is going to give them the best destination with the lowest cost, lowest risk, lowest carbon intensity, and lowest friction, and the most committed ecosystem leaders that, that have spoke to them today. Thank you. Well, the private sector, no pressure there then. Firing on all cylinders as we take the economic model to the moon. Uh, we admire and congratulate you on your stratospheric vision. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to leave our conversation there, but please join me in thanking my esteemed guests for their contribution at our forum today. Thank you, Rebecca, their excellencies, and to our other panelists for that fantastic thought-provoking discussion. I hope we keep your attention because we've got another very, very interesting panel coming up. Our third and final panel of the morning will be delving into the future of technology. No small topic. From a starting point of cloud computing, it will look at the role of various emerging technologies in shaping the kingdom's future and its global relationships and what the latest developments mean for us all. Innovative, disruptive, booming. Technologies we called emerging, such as blockchain, AI, and cloud computing will soon be the backbone of economies the world over. For investors looking to capitalize on this rapidly growing sector, Saudi Arabia's new cloud computing special economic zone is the ideal base. To succeed in these industries, you don't need much real estate. What you do need is access to the latest innovations, a large consumer market, and a supportive regulatory environment. By choosing to be part of Saudi Arabia's new cloud computing SEZ, you'll join giants who are already in the kingdom and become part of a vibrant cluster of leading global companies, 
who are shaping the future of tech. Saudi Arabia's special economic zones, unique gateways to growth. So good to see so many of you still here and we have captivated your attention. Now, let's get the panel up on. This conversation will be moderated by Neza Alawi, a prominent speaker on tech and development issues. Please put your hands together for Neza as she comes to the stage. And she's going to be joined by His Excellency, Dr. Mohammed Al Tamimi, Governor of Communications, Space and Technology Commission. Mr. Abdul Rahman Al Dahaiban, Managing Director, Middle East, Africa, and Turkey for Google Cloud. Ms. Reham Al Musa, Managing Director and Business Applications Head for Oracle. Mr. Gareth Hagan, CEO of OCO Global. And Mr. Guy Parsonage, Partner and Chief Experience Officer at PwC. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, and over to you, Neza. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us in this last but not least panel. In this panel, we're going to be envisioning the future of tech, digitalization, and cloud computing in Saudi, but also at a regional and global level. Today, we have prominent speakers from the public and the private sector that will take us through this envisioning. Your Excellency, can you please tell us about the role of the Commission and how does your mission contribute to making the Kingdom an attractive market to invest in? So first of all, thank you for having me and I would like to congratulate His Excellency the Minister of Investment Engineer Khaled Al Falah and EXA team for both uh, launching four special economic zones as well as this uh, uh, tremendous uh, form. Speaking of about the investor, let me shed light about the ICT se sector first. So within Saudi Arabia, uh, the ICT sector market size account for 154 billion SAR, and it's contribute to around 4.1% of the overall GDP of the kingdom. We believe this market is the largest market within the region. We believe this is the digital hub for the region and for the globe. And speaking specifically about technology, since the establish, establishment of CST or CIT, CITC in the past, it's the first time we're seeing that the tech market size exceeding the telecom size. This year, by the end of 22, uh, ma telecommunication or uh, IT market size equivalent to 81 billion SAR, which is exceeding mm -hmm. the telecom market. Talking specifically about cloud computing, definitely we are forecasting that spending on cloud computing in Saudi Arabia by 2030 will be contributing to 30% of the ICT spending. So this is a huge commitment from the demand side to the supplier side. Going back to your questions, what is the role of, of uh, CST? Mainly we're trying to promote, protect and balance the interest of uh, Saudi Arabia digital economy stakeholder. This is primarily in a simple uh, format. What does that mean? We try to promote the investment to minimize the risk of investment for the, and the investor. And that's why today we are launching and we are proud of that one, the cloud computing special economic zone and protecting the end user, whether it's business or government. And the third, we try to promote competitiveness. You usually are saying we protect the investment, not the, the we protect the, competitor, the competitiveness, not the competitor. So, in, in, in the way to, to enhance the demand, 
to make more demand for the cloud computing, we try to make sure that we have strong digital uh, foundation in Saudi Arabia. So with the partnership also with the private sector, we are proud to say that 99% of the kingdom covered by the internet, 53% covered by 5G, that's allowed to build multiple uh, case study or business cases, and top of that one, which is will fuel the demand for cloud computing, which is the brain for that use cases. Space, speaking specifically about Riyadh, where cloud computing sp uh, special economy zone is located, in the UN, they publish a very sophisticated report called E-Government Development Index. Mm -hmm. They rank Riyadh the fourth globally among 193 cities in the use of technology and its application. We're really proud of that one. And this is the reason why we're locating special economy uh, cloud computing SEZ in Riyadh. On top of that one, the 5G coverage, which as we said before, it's one of the fuel to build business case on top of that one, the 5G coverage in Riyadh, 94%, and it's ranking the city as the fourth capital city globally when it comes to 5G uh, coverage. We speak a lot about the demand and how to incentivize demand. Let me share a bit in a quick uh, about the demand. So if we pick only the, de the governmental demand, digital government authority, they aim to have a commitment from the government demand to the cloud to reach 50% adoption of cloud by 2025, and this is a lot. And 80% by 2030, adoption by the government of the cloud. So it will be a golden opportunity for the all investor, for our partner in the private sector to contribute and double down in the, dig in the cloud computing investment for the kingdom. One last thing that I want to highlight, it's always our job coming back to your questions, to make sure that we are removing any risk for the investment, to make sure their life is, is, is easy. Uh, and this is not the only one that we are doing, the incentive to the private sector. Last year, with the support of the, uh, of the leadership, we announced a competitive price tariff for energy, for cloud computing, that's 40% less than uh, standard prices. We believe this bundle of uh, incentives to the private sector will make a significant impact. Thank you, Your Excellency, and congratulations for the growth. Reham, how do you think that the new SEZ will upscale the Saudi tech sector? Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of it. Do you, I, I think that... On the mic. Hello? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this discussion and, and this historic occasion. And uh, let me elaborate uh, why I calling it historic. Saudi Arabia has enacted over 600 economic reform since the launch of the vision 2030 uh, in a bid to attract 12.4 trillion real of cumulative investment and 1.8 trillion real of foreign direct investment and flows between 2021 and 2030 as part of the national investment strategy. And definitely, ICT sector is playing a key role here, as mentioned by His Excellency. ICT sector in Saudi Arabia is considered the largest in the Middle East and uh, North Africa. And we are positioned to, to, to become a leading technology services and cloud hub, not only in the region, but globally. And I don't have to look far, we at Oracle we are driving an aggressive uh, cloud expansion uh, in the country, one of the fastest among uh, other providers. We recently announced an investment of $1.5 billion uh, to boost uh, the, the cloud computing capacity in the country. Uh, this includes setting up a third cloud region uh, uh, in Riyadh after Jeddah and Neom. Investments like Oracle's to accelerate digital transformation and the government initiatives to set up economic, uh, special economic zones are vital to um, attract foreign investment across multiple sectors, to boost the adoption of the latest technologies, which is key for the success of our country digital economy. And to your question, definitely those zones Will, will certainly act as a catalyst 
to strengthen the local IT talent and encouraging the existing workforce to upskill uh, uh, in order to make the best use of the latest technologies. And those investments are creating, uh, are building the right ecosystem for Saudis and global talent um, to explore uh, rewarding career opportunities in the kingdom's rapidly growing economy. And I'd like to add that uh, those opportunities in the digital economy, it's not limited only for students and professionals with the IT background alone. In fact, two years ago, we launched a career program uh, at Oracle called GenO, where we attract uh, young Saudis from diverse background and expose them to multiple functions and departments within Oracle, and then let them choose the field they want to progress in. So the opportunity is there, it's mm -hmm. big, and it's for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Reham. Uh, Abdurrahman, anything to add on this? And can you also tell us how Google has been supporting the kingdom in its digital transformation? Sure. Bismillah uh, rahim Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be with the panelists. Uh, and also would like to thank His Excellency Engineer Khaled, Engineer Khaled uh, Zahir as well, for being here and for inviting us to be part of it. Uh, actually, what uh, we have been witnessing, a massive uh, acceleration of digital transformation in most countries. And if I narrow it down to Saudi in particular, I think there is high adoption of the digital transformation that enabled us from Google Cloud perspective to make the decision. Usually for uh, Google Cloud to consider an investment, there are three key uh, parameters we take into consideration. Number one is the infrastructure. Second mm -hmm. is the policy and regulation. Third, business opportunity. All of these three components are highly and uh, widely available in the country. What uh, CIT and the team are doing in, uh, uh, in the government, in the country, uh, trying to adopt the right policy, because I think that's a critical milestone in implementing uh, cloud in, 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 the, in the country or any other specific uh, places that you need to consider. Taking that into consideration, that is, has enabled us to accelerate our presence. So we looked into the investment and we already had, uh, we're actually, we are announcing this year our uh, cloud region in, in Saudi. That itself is widely uh, and highly perceived for various reasons. Because of the strategy we apply for hyperscaler capability, we take into consideration key components, not just a matter of having an infrastructure, but also try to ensure that we have uh, issues associated with sustainability, what can we do to ensure that we use renewable energy, because that itself will have a significant impact in, in, uh, to, uh, to the country. Second, which is uh, something that we have observed, and it's not only us, but I'm sure that uh, almost every uh, international company, uh, the digital transformation that the country is driving created massive opportunity for, for, uh, uh, for organizations like ourselves and the rest of the company. Taking that into consideration and having the right infrastructure and the right policy to do the uh, to, to deploy cloud plus the business opportunity. One key pillar, which something cannot be neglected, is the capacity building initiative. You cannot have the right technology, but you don't have the right skill set. And that's what we did. We launched, we announced uh, several months ago, Center of Excellence. So far, we trained thousands of uh, government officials and, and even uh, private sector uh, uh, officials who are keen to learn about the latest, that's what Google Cloud uh, what Google Cloud uh, provides. We take this as a key, key pillar for our investment growth. We are very much excited again to be in the country to see the, the, the revolution that's going uh, throughout the country, and I'm sure that Saudi would be again, would be leading in that domain as a hub for the entire region. Thank you. Garrett, can you bring us your global perspective on how important and significant is the investment in the tech sector? Sure. If I can just also add my thanks to His Excellency uh, Ms. Ms. Ralph Fallon and the EXIT team for being involved today. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, so look, I have the fortunate perspective of looking across global investment and uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, of all the sectors, the most significant in terms of global investment is the technology sector and it has been that case for the last uh, decade or more. And if I were to drill further uh, into technology infrastructure, 
is the biggest uh, component of the technology sector. And to drill further again, cloud is by far the most significant um, element of the infrastructure uh, part of technology as well. So suffice to say, this is really important from an international uh, investor point of view. I mean, just to put some numbers around it, uh, the cloud sector alone uh, is forecast to be a $1 trillion industry by the end of this decade. And so therefore, this is a, a, a hot sector uh, and an area that uh, investors are very, very interested in. It's created 3,000 projects, uh, 350 billion of capital, and 160,000 jobs just in the last five years. So, you know, you've got to be in this space uh, in order to be kind of serious in the investment space. Um, we're very privileged to be sitting here today um, in Saudi. Um, it's also the case that the region is becoming an increasingly important part of the global tech landscape. So, you know, as, as recently as five years ago, if I were to take North America, uh, Asia, Pac, and Europe, it comprised uh, almost 90% of the global tech sector. That's actually now about 75% five years later. And the region that's picking up the majority of the slack in terms of global demand is where we sit at the moment in terms of the GCC. So again, lots of opportunity um, in this region. But with opportunity comes challenge. So the fact that the sector is so big, it's highly competitive. We should remember that digital investment is pretty mobile. So uh, you know, investors have choices as to where they can invest. Uh, they're increasingly uh, very interested. And I speak to investors and extremely interested in what's going on here in the kingdom. And I think the kingdom is to be applauded for the creativity, uh, for the ingenuity they've shown around uh, some of the uh, examples that my colleagues have spoken about already, and the uh, example of the cloud, as he said, that we're uh, talking about today. And look, you know, it's a complex space. Um, taxation is difficult in this space. I know that as someone who's from Ireland. I could talk about that with uh, really kind of real experience. But also, uh, talent is mobile. Uh, foreign talent uh, and getting the best and brightest into the kingdom is going to be uh, is going to be important as well. And so, therefore, all the initiatives that we've talked about are really for me, fundamental to kind of build on the great foundations that we have here in the kingdom and to really create uh, the tech sector that we all aspire to. Thank you. Guy, you're a chief experience officer at PwC. So we're going to use your expertise to uh, understand and emphasize on the importance of technology for other sectors' growth. So I like to think of technology and digital as oxygen. It's basically part of how we work and what we do. It is an essential part of all sectors. And as we've heard, it's one of the most significant, whether or not it should be a sector in itself or it should just be considered as a, as a horizontal across, across them all. Um, what, what we're seeing is the use of technologies across all the sectors is, is evolving rapidly. Uh, and particularly within the economic zones themselves, how they can use technology to differentiate themselves. How, to, how can they take advantages of the colleagues that we have and their service offerings that they provide to make sure that they're delivering something that is unique? These special economic zones have got such a competitive environment in which they're in. Uh, people have so many choices of where they can invest or go to within this territory that they need to be doing something which is unique and interesting. They need to provide a great experience themselves. And so I like to look to see the way that technology is being used to create a human experience, an experience that people want to engage with. And when I think of economic zones, I think of businesses being attracted. Those businesses need humans to work within those businesses, and those humans need places to live around them. And so it's that whole package which is so important. Um, and that's where I want to see technology being used with the likes of Metaverse Digital Twin for people to be able to see what is life going to be like in this area and why should I want to live there, work there, and do business there. Thank you. Back to you, Your Highness. How do you see cloud computing supporting the development of tech, but more precisely within the SEZ? So, well, I think my colleague already covered very well the importance of a cloud, but let me take it uh, this way. So, we all understand it's a fact that cloud computing is a cornerstone of ICT, and they already said that 30%, we are expecting in CST, 30% of the spending in ICT will be in cloud computing. We are expecting the ICT will be exceeding 200 billion SAR by 2030. That's uh, counted for almost 60 billion uh, SAR by 2030. 
And from the ICT perspective, we are all know that the core of the digital economy is ICT, and there is also another uh, narrow and broad. And we also know it by a fact from, from the World Bank report that the rate of growth of digital economy is four times faster than the wider economy or legacy economy as they called it. So there is a critical importance of cloud computing to incentivize all this uh, digital economy and the use cases within different sectors. We will not see a uh, flourish within the kingdom, uh, agri-tech, uh, ed-tech, fin-tech, rig-tech, flourished in, a, in, the, in, the, in the better scale without having a uh, solid cloud computing. Even space-tech, since we have two astronauts right now in the space uh, from Saudi Arabia, 80% of the, of the space economy coming from the downstream, 60% of that one coming from analytics of the data coming from the space, and that's been heavily uh, in the cloud computing. I will end with this. We are expecting this cloud computing special economy form will contribute additional contribution to the Saudi Arabia digital economy, uh, Saudi Arabia GDP by 7 billion SAR by 2030. Interesting. Thank you, Reham. What would you believe will be the next tech trends in the region? Um, automation powered by cloud technologies uh, is a major opportunity for businesses, uh, governments, uh, and consumers. Uh, and um, the cloud is the foundation of all digital technologies, including artificial intelligence. And this region is leading the way when it comes to modernizing the way we work and live using the latest digital technologies. The spend on artificial intelligence adoption in Middle East and Africa will reach $3 billion according to the latest worldwide AI spending guide from IDC. While this represents only 2% of global total, this region will see the fastest growth rate uh, worldwide over the coming years. With IDC forecasting uh, the region to reach to $6.4 billion by tw in 2026. It's a massive growth uh, within three years. And for years, Oracle has embedded AI and machine learning capabilities directly into our business application and cloud infrastructure to help customers process more data faster and cheaper in the context of their everyday workflows as they can ultimately make better decision, uh, better decision in their businesses. So uh, let me share with you one of uh, recent examples of innovative AI use as Saudi Arabia is one of uh, the member of the G20 countries, uh, Saudi Ministry of Foreign Affairs are working focused to provide training and development program for uh, Saud to match uh, Saudi talent with international opportunities at global institutions like United Nations. The ministry started to work on a project that will benefit from uh, AI powered technology to, uh, in terms of candidate recommendation, time to fill production using uh, intelligence automation features, and definitely besides providing a, a bit, uh, good, great uh, recruitment experience for the, for the candidates. And uh, definitely this is, um, it's an amazing project and working uh, for Saudis to have the opportunity working at international institution, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of pride for any Saudis. Thank you. Thank you, Reham. Thank you for sharing the future trends. And um, it's just great to see that we are here and, the, and that the region and Saudi is leading those trends. Abdurrahman, could you please share with us the most exciting technologies that you've been seeing in the region? I think there is a lot of, before we go into what are the technology, the next possible uh, revolution of technology, uh, throughout the previous year there has been massive investment in gathering data. So when data, now there are data uh, available for almost every single one, the question is how to get the best data for you to enable you make the right decision or get the answer of a question you don't even anticipate. 
That has created the, the hottest topic of all, which is AI, uh, which I believe this is something that has been uh, widely and highly uh, looked at by many organizations, customers, partners, even uh, vendors. But there is also two aspects that need to be considered for AI. Uh, from uh, the broader view, broader view, that AI now, is big, we see lots of demands to regulate the AI because that's something would require mass involvement. Can it be easily regulated? I think that's the question mark, but eventually it would be needed to, to do that regulation. I think that's the biggest challenge for many uh, countries or government officials really to look at that aspect. Second is associated to the vendor. From Google Cloud perspective, we look into security as a key component. We have seen and observed what has been announced about the recent AI announcement and the lack of security, the visibility of data to be widely used because you enter a certain domain that gives you an accessibility to all. From Google Cloud perspective, we pay attention to this solidly. We offer our, again, our generative AI offering like Bard and, and uh, solution is an ability of the customers to have their own data, their own VPN for them to make a decision to what data can be explored publicly and what data can be managed internally. And I think that could be a uh, game changer in the AI industry. There is also many aspects associated to, to uh, uh, new in technology. You've heard a lot about fintech, something that has been highly, again, widely used. And currently, we're working with the central bank on how can we uh, address this uh, from from a startup perspective, mm -hmm. trying to bring a large uh, fintech uh, provider in order to address the market potential here, and then create an opportunity for locals to go on a broader view. In my view, there is a lot of things, but it will, get, it will go back to the main point I just indicated, data. From a Google perspective, data is a key, uh, it's, a, it's our part of our DNA. That's why we believe that they, having the right data and the right, the right utilization of data throughout data analytics, AI, and other aspects will make a, a game changer in the industry. Thank you. And uh, SCZ is supporting uh, your point with uh, <laughs> bringing a new uh, Special Economic Zone uh, to, to support that. Um, Garrett, can you tell us your point of view on what is um, changing in, in companies' operations? Sure. So there's really only one answer to that question in terms of the most fundamental change for companies, and it's the adoption of technology. And uh, I don't say that just because I'm sitting on this panel. It's real, and uh, investors tell me that uh, all of the time. So. I mean, the question for any company is really what's the role of technology in your business? And if you don't know the answer to that question, I suggest that uh, you should uh, give it some thought uh, rather, rather quickly. So, so look, this, as has been said on the panel, this sector is fundamental uh, to, to industry. It's fundamental to investors. Uh, and so therefore, you know, kind of having the technology backbone here in the kingdom will uh, act as a magnet for investors, not just in the tech sector, but uh, Across, uh, across all sectors. And of course, you know, part of the ambition and part of the strategy around the SEZs is to accelerate and to catalyze uh, development across all industries and technology is at the heart of that. If I could maybe just bring that to life for a second, uh, I spent uh, last week on my journey here uh, traveling through Europe. And uh, it's interesting, I met a number of investors on my travels. Let me tell you about uh, two or three of those and how technology is uh, changing their business. So I started off the week in Dublin. Uh, I was meeting with uh, a $20 billion uh, advanced manufacturing company, um, Eaton, a very large US firm that you'll be familiar with. Speaking to the chief uh, product officer of Eaton, he wasn't talking to me about manufacturing. He wasn't talking to me about sort of uh, logistics. He was talking to me about technology uh, and the fact basically that connected devices, smart devices with the data being securely held in the cloud uh, and basically benefiting his clients is fundamental to that uh, kind of you know, significant manufacturing company. Um, I then went to London and I, I met a, a, a very uh, innovative company working in the energy space. Uh, and uh, their business 20 years ago was around making metal boxes and putting them into power plants. Uh, so a hardware business, if I can describe it that way. It's no longer that and it's a software business. So remote monitoring, uh, you know, kind of tracking performance of what's increasingly a complicated um, energy picture is only made possible by technology. And I was uh, fascinated to find that 500 miles away from uh, those power plants, there was a team remotely monitoring you know, that data and remotely monitoring performance 
through the cloud. So again, an example of how business is changing. And then finally, I was privileged to meet uh, what 20 years ago we probably would have called a biology company uh, responsible for developing clinical tests in the healthcare system. And that business now, of course, is as much a technology business because it's not about the clinical test, it's not about the laboratory, it's about the interpretation of data. It's about basically making informed decisions using AI, uh, using data science, improving healthcare outcomes, and then transmitting that in real time to clinicians who can you know, prescribe the right drugs, make the right treatments. So if you ever need any sort of uh, examples of how every business uh, is a technology business, hopefully those three of my experiences last week will kind of help to sort of paint that picture. And I think that's why you know, this initiative and everything we've talked about for the last uh, you know, half hour or so is so fundamental to the uh, economic story here in the kingdom. Thank you. Um, Guy, you've been witnessing the innovations of the kingdom. Can you tell us your point of view on its uh, promising future? So I think all of the technologies we've heard today, there's so much going on, so much excitement. I, what we're seeing with automation um, and in areas around content and how that can be created and delivered um, as provided as part of your messaging strategy or how that's coming across. Also, um, how AI is being used in, in government services and for special economic zones. We're currently running accelerators where we are piloting a, a range of services that can allow you to make all of what you're offering much more simplified in a chat-enabled way. Um, and I really think that the advantage of these zones being able to accelerate the adoption, make it connected, make it work, and deliver something which is m much more differentiated than what we're seeing in some of these other, uh, other destinations that are dealing with a lot more legacy issues. So I really want to see the adoption happening fast, but happening in a proper, consistent, and joined up way. So it's a very, very exciting time to be here. Uh, I've only recently moved to the region. I'm very excited to be here today. And uh, yeah, it's great, great, very exciting news. Thank you, Yi. Your Excellency, anything more you would like to share on the, spe the new special economic zone to close this panel? I just want to end with that uh, the cloud computing special economic zone is ready. Today we are lucky that we're receiving the license. The website is up and running. And uh, I will not reveal a secret, but today I think we're announcing two big cloud computing players joining the zone today. And we're already adding additional list of incentive, incentives. We are looking from the private sector more services, more in, uh, uh, innovations, and definitely larger economical uh, spillover. Thank you. Please give a big round of applause to our speakers. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Neza and that fantastic panel. I'd also like to take this opportunity to invite any of our guests and audience who are in our middle room to come back into the main auditorium at this point, um, or in the next few minutes if you can. We have a very exciting part of this fantastic event coming up, so please bear with us. Now, these special economic zones are brand new, but they've already attracted the attention of investors worldwide who've made substantial commitments. We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge all of our anchor investors. Lucid's investment will establish a planned new factory in King Abdullah Economic City that will bring advanced electric vehicle manufacturing to Saudi Arabia for the first time. Sears Investment in King Abdullah Economic City's SEZ will design, manufacture and sell a range of vehicles for consumers in Saudi Arabia and the wider region. <laughs> International Maritime Industries Investment in Ras Al Khair will increase the Kingdom's capacity in shipbuilding and offshore drilling rigs as well as offering MRO services at the heart of a crucial shipping lane on the Arabian Gulf. Al-Hadi Group's investment in Jazan will set up a food processing plant 
focusing on various pasta products, promoting localized production and enhancing food security in the region. And Saudi coffee company's investment in Jazan will construct a coffee processing plant to enhance local production capacity and establish Saudi coffee's brand on the global market. All told, Anchor investments in the SEZ's total 20 billion Saudi rials. Now this is an extraordinary testament to the compelling value proposition offered by each SEZ, as well as the whole kingdom as a sought after investment destination. Today we're delighted to announce the addition of several new investors who've embraced the incredible transformation potential of the new zones. Joining an esteemed group of investors, they contribute to our shared vision of unlocking remarkable opportunities. It's great, great pleasure that I welcome to the stage Mr. Nabil Koja, Secretary General of EXA, to join us on stage for this momentous occasion. Please put your hands together for Mr. Nabil Koja. So let us commence things and get underway by focusing our attention on the King Abdullah Economic City Special Economic Zone. I'd like to invite Mr. Fahad Al Saif, Chairman of Imar Economic City, and Mr. Majid Matbouli, Head of Industrial Valley, Imar Economic City, who are the master developers of King Abdullah Economic City. going to do is we're going to welcome their investors now and the first investor is Himma. Please join me in welcoming their chair Dr. Abdulaziz al Babtain, to the stage. Himma will be establishing a Saudi automotive and mobility export hub in KEC SEZ. The project aims to create a specialized and competitive environment that serves as an all-in-one destination for auto aftermarket parts, trading, logistics, light manufacturing and assembly, catering to the Africa and Middle East markets. Please put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen. Next is SIAC Construction, and I'd like to welcome to the stage their chairman, Mr. Nehad Ragab. <laughs> Through KAEC SEZ, SIAC Construction aims to create a specialized building materials hub to support a number of construction and infrastructure projects in the region. If your excellencies could please remain with us on stage. Next, we have, we'll remain on stage. No, okay, we'll take you guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your help today. Next is Ras Al Kahair Special Economic Zone. And I'd like to invite His Excellency Khalid bin Mohammed Al Salem, President of the Royal Commission for Jubail and Yambu, and Mr. Ahmed Hassan. CEO of Ras Al Khair City for Mining Industries to welcome their investors. Welcome to the stage, gentlemen. And the first investor is McDermott Arabia Company, and I'd like to welcome Mr. Freelas Susan, VP of Operations.
McDermott will be developing fully integrated engineering and construction solutions to the energy industry. Welcome, gentlemen. We have the whole team. <laughs> And the next investor is Makin Energy, a joint venture formed by Saudi Aramco, Hyundai Heavy Industries, and Saudi Arabian Industrial Investment Company, Dassault. And I'd like to invite their CEO, Mr. Abdullah Al Gamdi, up here. Makin specializes in manufacturing, building, selling, and servicing marine and land-based engines, supporting a rapidly growing industry crucial to global trade flows. Please, once again, put your hands together. <music> Lastly, Bao Steele, and I'd like to welcome to the stage Mr. Juan Wang, Deputy General Manager and CFO. Bao Steel is an international iron and steel company headquartered in China, who intends to establish an integrated steel plate manufacturing complex within the zone. I'd like to invite up to the stage with us Dr. Hussan Fadli, CEO for Jazan City for Primary and Downstream Industries, to welcome the new investors to Jazan Special Economic Zone. Welcome. Our first investor is Pure Salmon. And I'd like to invite their chairman, Mr. Stefan Farouz, to the stage. Pure Salmon is a land-based salmon aquaculture company using a proven in-house recirculating aquaculture system technology to sustainably produce fresher and fully traceable salmon locally. Now, their ambition plan includes a production company capacity of 10,000 tons per year. Another round of applause, well deserved. Next is Mashrek, and I'd like to invite to the stage their deputy CEO, Mr. Ali Al Ghazwani. Mashrek aims to establish a food facility for processing over 5,000 tons of tomato products. And last but certainly not least, we have Wang Kang Group, and I'd like to welcome their CEO, Mr. Wang Shen. Wang Kang is an industrial investor planning to produce a range of glass products on a significant scale. One million 
tons a year. Congratulations. Thank you, gentlemen. Next is Cloud Computing Special Economic Zone, and I'd like to invite His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Al Tamimi, Governor of the Communications, Space and Technology Commission, and Mr. Raid Al Fayez, Deputy for Information Technology and Emerging Technologies, to commemorate the signing of new MOUs for the Cloud Computing Special Economic Zone. Welcome, gentlemen. The first MOU is with Microsoft to discuss potential collaboration opportunities in the Cloud SEZ. I'd like to welcome Mr. Tamar Al Harbi, Microsoft President of Saudi Arabia. Congratulations. The next MOU is with Oracle to discuss potential collaboration opportunities in the Cloud SEZ. I'd like to welcome Mr. Fahad Al Turaif, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Vice President for Saudi Arabia, Levant, and North Africa. Now, in addition to these new four zones, we'd also like to announce new investments in the Riyadh Integrated Special Logistics Zone. I'd like to invite His Excellency Abdulaziz Al Duwalij, President of the General Authority of Civil Aviation, and Mr. Awad Al Salami, the EVP for Logistics Services, to the stage. They will warmly welcome the new investors joining Riyadh's integrated special logistics zone. Firstly, we have Balkambi and Ajlan, and I'd like to welcome to the stage Mr. Simone Nublok. Chief Operating Officer from Valcambi and Mr. Fad Al Enezi, CEO Mining and Metals Industry Group from Ajlan. Valcambi and Ajlan will establish a precious metals refinery and distribution center within the zone. Welcome, gentlemen. Next, we have Hicks Vision, and I would like to welcome to the stage their vertical business directors, Mr. Nicola Yuan and Mr. Robert Wang.
Hikvision is a subsidiary fully owned by Hangzhou Hikvision Digital Technology. They are set to operate a facility for light manufacturing and serve as regional distribution hub for their cutting edge security equipment. I would also like to now invite all of their excellencies, our new investors and signing partners and our anchor investors to gather on the stage for a group photograph. And please, can we also put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Mr. Cyril Payaya. So we can get everybody back up on stage for a group photograph. So therefore, please, can we welcome back to the stage, Lucid, Seer, International Maritime Industries, Al Hadi Group, Saudi Coffee Company, Apple, iHub, and Shalub Groups. group photograph. Huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen this momentous occasion. Thank you all. Together, the SEZs have today welcomed over 27 billion Saudi rials in new investments, bringing total SEZ investments to 47 billion Saudi rials. In addition, other investments in progress total an impressive 116 billion Saudi rials. And these strong figures highlight the strong appeal that these zones hold for global investors. Now, this is just the beginning, and we eagerly await more investors to create their own gateways to growth in Saudi Arabia's special economic zones. So far today, we've explored the SEZ ecosystem and regulatory framework, heard perspectives on the importance of specialist industries, logistics and supply chains, and surveyed tech of the future. We've also met the partners who've helped shape the SEZ ecosystem and celebrated investments from Anchor and new investors. We now invite you to the lunch hall. Time for some food and for a working lunch as we do have our final session, a presentation on the Saudi Regional Headquarters Programme that will kick off promptly at 1.40. Please don't miss it. And you can also check out the SEZ booths and speak to representatives who will gladly answer all of your questions. I'll see you in there shortly.
multinational corporations to position themselves at the most strategic locations in MENA, Saudi Arabia. It's one of the most ambitious programs that was launched to enable multinational corporations to expand in the MENA region. Now, let us start by playing you the RHQ video. Enjoy. Saudi Arabia is quickly becoming one of the world's most important business hubs. Our energy is palpable, our potential limitless, our ambitions becoming reality. Visionary and industry leading companies are helping drive our transformation by opening regional headquarters here. The regional headquarters program, RHQ, was created to help multinational companies to use Saudi Arabia as the hub for their regional operations and expansion. They're harnessing young, skilled local talent, developing leading technologies, tapping into unique ecosystems, like the Riyadh Integrated Logistics Zone and the four special economic zones Using the kingdom's competitive advantages to make their supply chains more diverse and resilient, Saudi Arabia is committed to helping position their employees and families for a fulfilling and successful long-term presence in the kingdom. Leading global firms and growing have realized that now is the time and Saudi Arabia is the place to harness the unparalleled business opportunity the Middle East and North Africa presents, the Regional Headquarters Programme. Your head start to regional success. Gentlemen, thank you. Now, as you can see, the Kingdom is fully committed to developing a world-class environment for attracting and enabling multinational corporations to establish their regional headquarters. Now, please put your hands together. There's been lots of clapping today, but we have a little bit more because I would love to invite to the stage Mr. Hassan Al Duhaim. He's the senior advisor to His Excellency Minister Investment, and he'd like to say a few words. Very good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much for attending and joining us in this important event. And thank you very much for IGZA for bringing us together and organizing this event. And it's a great pleasure for the Archu program to be partnering with IGZA in this important event. Allow me to say a few words about the RQ in less than two minutes. As you saw in the video, the RQ is about creating a conducive investment environment to position multinational company to establish their presence in Saudi and to serve the regional headquarter as a MENA region and in some cases in a bigger scope. So basically the investor who joined the program, they saw benefits looking into the regional headquarter from different eyes, from different perspectives. As you saw in the video, the program is not only about the licensing, it's not only about attracting the campaigns, it's looking into attracting global talent. It's about integrating with the global supply chain. It's about integrating into the accessibility of a regional market. And more importantly, it's creating a conducive ecosystem 
to enable our new activity. Today, I was super excited to see five special economic zone in motion. And this is a great showcase of how the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is repositioning itself and the investor at the regional level by creating those special economic zones in order to access a larger scale beyond the domestic and to serve reg the regional headquarter. The program is very well developed. It's gaining a lot of momentum. It's moving with a great interest from multinational companies. It was so interesting to me to see some of the companies who chose to establish the first footprint and the first presence in the region through the regional headquarters, which shows the importance and the ability for the company to utilize the regional headquarters as a regional hub. Let me end my quick remarks with a few words about the benefit of the regional headquarters. Today, the regional headquarters is enabling the company to attract and to retain the talent under the regional headquarters without any restrictions, without any challenges. And also, the regional headquarters companies is enjoying the facilitation given by MISA and all the government entities to go through a re-engineered, seamless business process to activation. It's not about getting a license, it's about full activation and enabling the company to relocate their employees. In the coming video, we will show you a short presentation about the companies who already joined the program, and they will talk about their experience, and they will talk about how they see the regional headquarters fit in their expansion and strategy. Thank you very much for attending. It's a pleasure meeting with you here and seeing you. And please enjoy the lunch and enjoy seeing the video. Thank you very much. Today, the kingdom is as exciting. flagship office. Today, I am proud that we have grown to over 2,000 people across six offices in the kingdom. In 12 months, we doubled our workforce, we trebled our Saudi employees, and probably most markedly, we quadrupled the number of women working for Bechtel in this country. Saudi Arabia is now Bechtel's second largest country after only the United States. This is an extraordinary nation, achieving absolutely extraordinary things. And I would just take a moment to commend the young Saudis that we now have working for us in the kingdom. I think the kingdom can be very, very proud of its sons and daughters and their contribution to the country's transformation. Alstom is a global leader in smart and green mobility and we have contributed in many of the iconic projects of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In terms of green mobility, we have partnered with Saudi Arabian Railway to develop a hydrogen train for the Kingdom and the region. And this will be in line with the Saudi Green Initiative and the net zero target for 2060. The Saudi market is very important for KBMG as a global firm. We believe in bringing leading international practices combined with distinct local expertise to achieve the best possible outcomes. We are proud to be making the next step and become part of the regional headquarters program, fulfilling its targets as well as supporting and developing the national economy as part of our Kingdom's Vision 2030. And that draws to a close our forum today. But just before I do go off stage, a few thank yous 
Of course, to you all, our esteemed guests, panelists, and the regional headquarters program who joined us, all the audience from today, and lastly, our hosts, EXA, for making this such an engaging and inspiring event. Thank you once again. We look forward to many exciting developments ahead for the new special economics zones and invite you to explore the game-changing opportunities presented by the kingdom's SEZs to accelerate your business growth. The SEZs will be delighted to receive your inquiries and support you in realizing your ambitions. And with that, thank you so much. I hope you've had a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of your lunch. Thank you. Thank you.